<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm sorry for the slight delay, but delighted to see you here. And um, we've got a good day ahead of us. We're here post this, this is the first of these events post pandemic. And the last time we had an event with the OBC was 2014. And we're delighted to kick off the new series with them today. We're also delighted to be here courtesy of and, and in association with the museum. So that's another delightful aspect. And before I hand over to Chris Goody and Douglas, may I also say we're particularly delighted to kick off the day with Pamela Rasmussen talking to us about citizen science and avian taxonomy. Thank you all very much. Hi everyone, I'm Chris from the Oriental Bird Club. I'm your chair today and indeed beyond. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, fantastic round of speakers today. Super excited to have everyone here. If you don't know about the Oriental Bird Club, we were formed in 1984, uh, so coming up for 40 years already. Our primary role in life is conservation of those birds. If you're not a member already, do come and see me afterwards and uh, you'll sign up. Uh, with that ado, I'm going to hand over to Douglas, who's going to introduce our first speaker for us. Thank you, Douglas. Hello, right. Pleasure to see everybody. Uh, so my name is Douglas Russell. I'm the senior curator of Birds, Eggs and Nests at the Natural History Museum. Uh, it's lovely to see everybody here. Um, so the British Ornithologist Club was started 127 years ago by my predecessor. And we have continued our collaborations between the British Ornithologists Club and the Natural History Museum up to this day. So it's a very great pleasure to introduce Rasmussen, who is going to be is the, currently the lead taxonomic expert for Birds of the World at Cornell. Uh, Pam is the uh, author of the Ripley Guide and has a long history of research on Asian birds. <coughs> and it is a pleasure for Pam to come up and talk to us about avian taxonomy in the era of citizen science. Pam, thank you. <laughs> All right, can you hear me all right? Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward to uh, telling you about uh, avian taxonomy. Let's see if I can make this work. Avian taxonomy in the era of citizen science. And I am pretty new at uh, uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, so I hope I'm not violating anything too much by putting this backwards. But anyway, uh, there it is. <laughs> um, so, Today, basically, what I would like to focus on is the mutualism, basically, between avian taxonomy and citizen science, how we can have an, an influence on taxonomy and how taxonomy affects us and citizen science. And in case there's any non-birders here, uh, why are we so interested in, in birds? Well, basically because they are the best known organismal group that more people are interested in than any other group. And they have a lot of roles to play in ecosystems that are essential. And they, uh, they're just amazing. So I think we're all, I think I'm preaching to the choir there. So what's taxonomy? I think everybody knows, but just to be sure, Basically, it's the classification of organisms or taxa. And in the past and up to the present, most taxonomy has been based solely on external morphology, what we can see of the bird. Uh, now we typically and hopefully use more types of data, genetics if, if available, and, and uh, the Availability of genetic work is, is dramatically increasing all the time. And of course, still morphology as well as vocalizations, sometimes ecology, reproductive isolation if we, can, if we have that, the data on it. And most people, most birders, and many members of the general public are especially interested in species limits. So taxonomy isn't just species limits, but that's uh, what most people are interested in. And why is that? Well, because species are the units that we use most in scientific study and in conservation. 
and even law enforcement, and obviously birding as well. Well, what's a species? Depends who you ask. There are many, many different uh, published definitions of species, but the two main species concepts are the PSC or phylogenetic species concept and the BSC or biological species concept. Phylogenetic species are basically those that are diagnosable, whether they interbreed or not. And or biological species or BSC species are groups of interbreeding organisms that don't generally interbreed with other such groups. And when we compare what we can, uh, the two concepts, we find that uh, many species are considered species under both concepts, but many others are not. Uh, generally, the BSC will, is more conservative and recognizes fewer species because of the, uh, the um, requirement that they be non-interbreeding. Uh, non and uh, on the other hand, the PSC uh, generally doesn't recognize uh, subspecies. So uh, if you consider, sub, well, subspecies are also taxa, so the number of taxa recognized by PSC adherence would be lower overall. But almost all of our taxonomic lists and authorities and committees use the BSC. So again, most species were originally diagnosed based on their morphology. And typically, we consider them to be a separate species if they differ obviously in multiple ways from other such species. If they have just a few differences or very minor differences, we generally consider them subspecies. But our perception of birds doesn't necessarily uh, um, give us a very good idea of how they perceive each other. For example, flickers are, oh, it's not working. This isn't working, is it? Sorry? I can't see it. Anyway, um, so our perception of flickers is uh, obviously different than theirs because they will just go ahead and hybridize no matter what the underwing color, no matter what the facial pattern, they don't seem to care. But my interpretation is that that doesn't mean that that's true of all woodpeckers, so we can't really use that as a, um, as a marker for, for speciation in woodpeckers. We also have to bear in mind that birds don't see things the exact way we do. Many of them have UV vision or UV coloration or both. And many of them, at least maybe, maybe all of them, have much better color vision than humans do. So we can't really see what they see. In terms of vocalizations, we have a lot of birds that we can easily determine species based on, on vocalizations. Uh, some that don't seem to differ at all to us in, in appearance, like willow and alder flycatchers, but they don't seem to have any trouble. They can tell each other apart by voice and maybe by other mechanisms that we don't understand. And they're exa an example of many, many species that are cryptic but seem to be reproductively isolated anyway. And our ability to capture and work with vocalizations has dramatically improved in recent years and has led to a revolution in, in taxonomy. Lots of splitting, some lumping, and lots of uh, new species being described. But we still have lots of obstacles. One is sample size methodology, and how to interpret uh, whether vocalizations are homologous or not. Uh, if you're comparing like with like, if you're not comparing like vocalizations, um, then your comparison is pretty meaningless. We also have issues, of course, of vocal learning, of dialects, et cetera, that complicate the issue. It's not easy to understand how to interpret variation that would be learning based on learning or based on dialects. And then we have taxonomic inertia. And my example here is the two um, well, the egrets, the old world and new world great egrets that sound completely different, and yet no one has done anything about it that I know of. So it's waiting. Somebody needs to do something. Anyway, and there are lots and lots of examples of that. 
Um, and then again, bird auditory perception is not identical to ours. It's not very well studied, but there are uh, well studied examples showing that birds have better temporal discrimination than we do, but it's not known whether that's the generality or just in some species. But we can assume that they have better hearing, at least in that respect, than we do. So they may perceive things differently than we do. And we know that they're much better at recognizing each other by voice than we are, for example. So I'm going to take a walk down memory lane here for a little while and look at taxonomy before citizen science. And basically, it was authority based. So. Um, we had museum scientists mostly, or sometimes just university scientists who would work in the museums and produce works that, that were comprehensive and were the authority. And you basically had to do your research that way. There wasn't any alternative. A lot of good work, a lot of fundamental work was done. I'm not denigrating that at all. And way back when, there was this owlet, the forest owlet, that seemed to have disappeared in 1914, but that turned out to be fraudulent based on a Meinertzagen record, and it was hypothesized that it might not even be a good species. Um, this is from one of the early specimens. Only seven specimens were ever collected, but um, I got interested in it and did an analysis of the seven known specimens and had a painting commissioned by Larry McQueen that showed that the two upper birds, which represent the forest owlet, were very different than the common spotted owlet, which they had been confused with. And in that research, which I conducted laboriously in museums and just looking at museum catalogs, et cetera, the old way, um, I was able to, to re find out a lot about their morphology, but also uh, figure out that no one had really searched for them in the places that they had ever been reported, the four known specimen localities from the 1800s, 1880s. So I went in 1996, that's a long time ago now, uh, to look at those four sites, assuming that we wouldn't find it, but um, <clears throat> thought I'd give it a try. And uh, we searched for 12 days with no idea whether to look at, you know, during the day or the night or both, no idea that the habitat really um, and it started to get grimmer and grimmer. In fact, that we were told that there was no forest left at our last site, so we thought we'd just go there anyway. And there, there it was, 8.30 in the morning, bare branch, bright sun. And now, of course, everything has changed because when we found it, it hadn't been seen for 112 years, but now, whoops. And that was one of the photos of the rediscovery now. Of course, everything has changed in terms of uh, photography as well. But uh, now there's lots of sites. So it's known from a number of places. It's still quite a rare bird, but it's been uh, upgraded from critical to endangered, still endangered, still. The fact that there were only ever seven specimens uh, collected tells you something about the rarity of this bird, but it is not quite as endangered as previously thought. And now, there are 677 photos just on eBird, 53 recordings, et cetera, so and going up all the time. So that's one example. Another is that when I was doing the field guide, um, I needed photos. We were using museum specimens a huge amount. We were using tremendous numbers of museum specimens, primarily from the Smithsonian, sending them to the artists. But we needed photos so the artists could see what the birds really looked like in life. Um, but there, weren't, there were hardly any. So I actually made a, a clip photo file from magazines and, and I used color Xeroxes and everything and sent those to the artists. And I used those as well to check the plates. And they were an important part of putting this book together. But now, would you spend your time doing that? <laughs> I don't think so. I haven't looked at that photo file since then. So <laughs> things have changed. Also with sound recordings, there were no archives available. There was no there was, there was um, British Library had a lot, but you had to order, you had to find it, and you had to order it specifically, and then you had to wait. Same with Macaulay, uh, the Cornell Library. So getting recordings was a huge challenge, but there were things were changing in the, at that time, and um, at first I thought I was going to have to just use vocal descriptions 
that are really, really flawed, done by a whole bunch of different um, writers at different times based on who knows what. So I, didn't, I knew that would be um, unsatisfying and not very useful, but uh, things were changing in terms of the availability of recordings and, and sonogram software and, and uh, space on computers and everything. And uh, people were starting to make sound recordings. So a few tour leaders had uh, built up their own collections. So I was able to get contracts out for a few people, especially Paul Holt and Craig Robson, et cetera. And, and so that we built up a pretty good sound library from those sources, but it wasn't meant to be made public except as uh, description and transcription and sonograms in the field guide. But now, again, I would never have spent my time doing that because now there's hundreds of, of recordings available for many species and at least something for most. Still, there are lots of gaps. Still, there's lots of, lots of room for improvement and improvement in, in how the recordings are documented, et cetera. But there's a tremendous amount more and uh, it's, a, it's a whole new ball game. And then, Again, in 2008, there was hardly anything online for, uh, for Asia, and I started a website called Avocet, Avian Vocalization Center, and it was meant to be freely available, globally, uh, global sound repository with high data quality and to involve a lot of local people and students, et cetera, which we did. Um, and we also used it as a voucher for um, quite a few papers, new species, et cetera. But, it became clear very quickly that with Xenocanto going global and Macaulay Library getting drag and drop, <laughs> it became clear that there was no way that I could input all those recordings um, and keep up in, in any way. So it was useful, but it's lived, you know, it's now being incorporated actually this month into the Macaulay Library. So. And I just got a confirmation from the last major recordist that he's good with that, so yay. Anyway. Um, so then a little bit about OBI, and I hope I don't, you don't mind if I mention this. Um, this was a project started in 2002 that Chris did and uh, became huge, gigantic. Um, now it's archived at ML, so um, thank you. <laughs> anyway, so now, what's, what are things like now? Well, I think everybody knows, but our major relevant citizen science projects for birds, relevant to taxonomy, are eBird, iNaturalist, and Xenocanto. Xenocanto is restricted to sounds. eBird, of course, what can I say? It's just huge, growing all the time. It's got so many features. Um, and I'm, I kind of live on it. <laughs> but anyway, um, the main thing for Taxonomy is search photos and sounds. We can come back to that, but all these other features are useful too. But this is uh, kind of the go-to site. iNaturalist is almost as big for birds. Still, still uh, almost all the species, lots of people involved. And, but I don't find it as easy to, to use the resources. Not that I've tried that much, because I'm always on eBird. Um, Xenocanto, I'm on that a lot too, and I'm sure many of you are. Uh, here's an example of a species you all know very, very well that has lots of races, but some of them are going to, well, turning into species now based on some recent papers, um, Madeira and, and Azores chaffinches, and now it's very easy to, to get the, to just click on the, the dots for that race and, and get the recordings on Xenocanto. You can do a similar thing with eBird, of course, but not the exact same way. And... Um, Make your own decision on whether these things are really that vocally different, et cetera. But they are genetically different, et cetera, so we know they're not actually not, not each other's closest relatives. And then lots of listing software like iGoTerra. This is not um, exactly the same thing. This is not exactly citizen science, but a lot of people use it and put their photos up. And there are lots of other archives for photos that presumably will be curated into the future. And we have uh, four major global taxonomic committees, the Howard and Moore Committee or, or um, project that has been updated through the fourth is being updated into a projected fifth, but that's by uh, subscription. And it is on, the fourth is online, but not um, 
not being updated the same way as the others. The others are all being updated at least yearly, well, almost always. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and yet they're all now part of the working group of avian checklists, the WGAC of the uh, International Ornithological Un Ornithologist Union, and so they're being aligned. Now HBW, bird life is being aligned to, at a different pace and more, details aren't all worked out, but at least there isn't a lot, a lot of alignment happening, so there's a lot more consistency between checklists now. So we've got a committee that is making those decisions and many of the changes are being incorporated in the updates. So I'm actually on that committee, the WGAC, and feeding things into the Clements and also the IOC checklists. <clears throat> so how do, how do taxonomists use citizen science? Well, we use them all the time. We're on these, these websites all the time, uh, making indirect comparisons. And we have to remember that it's not the same as using museum specimens, but you can only, you know, there's, none of us have full time to work on, to, to spend in museums and, and do this work. But, so we have to know what you know how to deal with the shortcomings of photos and the pitfalls. But there's so many excellent photos out there, so many uh, different localities represented for many species. Uh, it really is really useful. And um, we can also often make inferences about zones of intergradation, et cetera, or parapatry based on if there's a lot of photos from either side of the, of the contact zone, et cetera, and you don't see any intergrades, or if you see a lot, for example, uh, you can make inferences about the width of the hybrid zone. It's not, it's not the um, ideal kind of, of study, but it's better than not having any information. And here's an example, the mealy parrot, where we have a incongruence between genetic studies which show a really deep divide between northern, middle American, and uh, mostly South American populations. And it seems to be coincident with the described morphological variation, which is, uh, so here we have extremes from Guatemala and Bolivia, but there's, the intermediate birds are in, um, in southern Central America. There are a lot of morphological differences that led BirdLife and HBW to split them and IOC to follow suit. But then there was a more recent analysis using vocalizations that showed complete overlap in their vocalizations. And there could be issues with, it could be that a different vocal analysis might find some differences, but clearly they're very similar vocally. And if you just look at photos on Macaulay Library, you see a wide range of intermediacy and it's really hard <laughs> to pin down any kind of uh, break in the, in the phenotypes based on photos that are online. So really anyone can, can do this, anyone can find out this information. So even though this, the split came up this year, despite that deep genetic divergence, it didn't pass. It might be that they are biological species concept, or biological species, but the current data don't seem to support it. Well, how about museum collections? So how does this, how do museum collections uh, relate to all this? Well, actually the museum specimens are complementary to citizen science projects. And we still uh, have the same importance of museums as always, the fact that they hold the uh, the key to understanding our biodiversity and what it's, what it's based on. They have the name-bearing types, the uh, specimens that taxa are founded on that are irreplaceable and must be preserved. They have voucher specimens from different localities, series that allow you to determine geographic and all other types of variation and differences between species, and even use as, uh, as a source for DNA studies, isotope studies, etc and to be used by artists. So artists can use photos to a great extent, but they really need the specimens to have, to be able to directly compare them, to be able to get the morphology, the, the differences, right, the, the, the subtleties of color, et cetera. They really need those specimens. So I would say they're more valuable, not less valuable than ever, and irreplaceable. I think I'm preaching to the choir here too. But, we need citizen science too. We need these photo archives. Here's an example. The um, 
crimson-breasted woodpecker was split by uh, HBW BirdLife by the checklist. And yet when I was looking into this for a, for a proposal for the WGAC, I found a lot of confusion because Ludlow described a race in southern Tibet from the Pernii group, which is the eastern group. And that seemed to indicate uh, sort of a mishmash of characters. But then when uh, looking into it more carefully, um, it turned out that if you just line up specimens, the differences in, the really obvious differences in live birds in position of the red patch in males are obscured in specimens. They can look like this one, they can look representative, or they can be kind of pushed back onto the nape and the, the head is flattened. You can't see the difference between them, the really major difference. So that and other, other uh, differences between these led to WGAC to pass this split as well. So this is just one, of the, one example of how photos supplement museum specimens. What about sound recordings? Well, of course, voice can be key to, to species recognition in many groups, especially those that are cryptic and often nocturnal. Um, the ideal way to use sound recordings is to have scientific analyses of homologous vocal types accompanied by two-way controlled breeding season playback experiments. But those are not so easy to do because you, you know, involves, it generally involves a lot of travel and uh, uh, timing, et cetera, and it's a lot of work. So they're not really very often available. The, vote, the analyses are getting more and more feasible, more and more possible to do. Um, but sometimes, I mean, even, even a small analysis takes a while and takes, takes a lot of work and, and uh, time to get published. But we can often make some inferences based on, on pretty obvious differences. And uh, Peter Bozeman did a lot of analyses for the HBW BirdLife uh, checklist that were really useful in making quick decisions. They're generally based on, on lower, lower amounts of data than are available now. And they're some, um, they, they need, they're very, very useful, but they, other types of analyses need to be done as well. And often there's not enough material, often there's not enough documentation of which type of vocalization we're looking at, and often there's a lot of complexity. So often it's not possible to just eyeball it and say this is very different because you don't you don't know how much, what that complexity means. Then of course we have dialects that complicate the issue. But here's an example of a of a bird that looks very very similar. The um, Himalayan uh, and Eastern Indian greater flameback and the Western Ghats one that was described as a separate race, Socialis. It's smaller, shorter crest, a little bit, a little bit darker, but really, really similar looking. And Paul Holt had noticed that they didn't respond to playback in the Western Ghats, playback of the Himalayan birds in the Western Ghats. And he thought they sounded really different. And I noted that in our first edition and then split it in the second when we had more citizen science um, recordings that confirmed that. Fortunately, now there's a, there's a published study that's uh, pretty comprehensive that confirmed really significant differences between Socialis and um, Gutta Cristatus, the Himalayan one, in both calls and drum rolls, more different than the very morphologically different Sri Lankan one. But now we have an additional complica uh, complication because people are starting to find um, one or the other in areas that, they, that there are no specimens from in southern India that we don't know what they are. Nobody's got any recordings yet, and, or at least put them on uh, eBird yet. And um, so the jury's out, but it might be a contact zone. We don't know if there's going to be parapatry. We don't know what the situation is. But they are split. They're very different. <clears throat> okay, so what about video? Well, most people don't take video, but it is now possible to upload video to citizen science um, websites, and uh, these can be really useful. And as an example, a recent um, proposal for the, for the uh, North American Checklist Committee was on the potential split of the palm crow, and um, I wrote this proposal. So um, it was 
proposed to be a separate species in Hispaniola versus Cuba based on, on voice in 1997, but the, uh, the data were, um, you know, there weren't very many data and it wasn't followed widely. It was uh, given a limbo split in the uh, recent Kerwin field guide to West Indies. Um, and yet other, some other taxonomists had thought they weren't even separate subspecies. So um, now there's a DNA study that shows them to have moderate divergence. They're sister species with moderate divergence. So at least they're um, comparable in that respect to other crow species, but that doesn't tell you that they're separate species. Um, but they do have consistently different vocalizations. And one additional feature is that the Hispaniolan birds, and that's my bad photo there, sorry about that, but um, it does show what they do, which is they cock their tail and they droop their wings rather dramatically when they're calling. And there are lots of videos online that show that for Hispaniola. It's habitual with them. Cuban birds, nobody's ever said they do that, and nobody's ever put any recordings on online that I can find that show that either. So we need somebody to go to Cuba and, and document this and make, make it clear whether they do or they don't. I think they don't, but I can't prove it. And exactly what that means, we're not sure either, but it's, it would be at least um, congruent with species status, which has now passed, by the way. Here's another example. Um, I don't need to go through the whole thing, but just a kind of randomly chosen example of a species complex, uh, the yellowish bulbul and Sorry, Des, we didn't, uh, we didn't do the three-way, but you know, I'm guessing at some point it will be because um, of your recordings. So anyway, so it's basically, it was split but three ways by HBW um, and uh, BirdLife, but um, it's pretty clear that the Comegan birds, and there's more data for the Comegan birds. Comegan is a tiny island just north of, of Mindanao, shown there in red, and they're, they're just obviously a different species. Hey, Naldi, it looks different, sounds different, but it you know, probably needs a bit more analysis to make that cut. But the upside is that anybody can suggest changes to WGAC and hopefully you know, might, might lead to these things actually being enacted. Okay, how about how taxonomy is used in citizen science? Well, basically, you can't really do citizen science in, bird, uh, in birds without having a hierarchy that, that shows relationships. You have to have your data organized, and it needs to be based on the relationships of birds. So the taxonomy informs the citizen science project about evolution, about relative divergence at the family order, well, order, family, genus, species, and subspecies level. And it also has the effect of incentivizing citizen science data collection because everybody wants to see every species, right? Well, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people want to see every species or as many as they can. And that's what drives them, those species lists. And then it gets you know, into the photo list, how many birds have you photographed and put on, on iNaturalist or, or eBird. Etc. cetera, and, and of course many people keep uh, site lists, county lists, day lists, et cetera. Um, all that has to be updated. New findings have to be incorporated, otherwise it, it's no, no longer valuable. <clears throat> so we do have an update uh, coming up for eBird Clements, and it's due next month, late. And um, everything gets updated, Every, all the Cornell uh, Lab of Ornithology projects get updated at the same time using that, tax, that Clements taxonomy. Um, eBird, Merlin, Birds of the World, and all the other projects. So it's a pretty big deal um, to get all that settled and then all these other ancillary projects updated. And it's, it's actually a huge amount of work for everyone that's involved in these projects just to do that. They basically drop everything else and work on that. And we have a lot of, of changes this year. And uh, how am I doing on time? OK. Um, a lot of species changes, some, a few lumps, and uh, lots of genus changes as well, a few other things. 
This is all part of the WGAC alignment project, so we're getting closer and closer to being aligned with IOC, being aligned with uh, bird life. And it also aligns to some extent with some regional works. So how can your birding, if you're not a trained taxonomist or uh, if this is an avocation for you, how can your birding be more useful to taxonomy? Well, I recommend getting to places that not everyone goes. So, get, go, you know, if you can go to the places that everyone goes to, but get to more out of the way places, add some new sites to the, uh, the maps. Um, Visit areas if you can get in, be informed about possible contact areas, zones of that might be either intergression or parapatry. If you can inform yourself before going and figure out where you can go to solve some of these conundra, that would be great. Um, that's what quite a few people have done with with certain other spe certain species. And um, take a lot of media. So. Uh, the more the better, and try to document as carefully as possible, like how many different individuals were involved and, and what they were doing, what the, uh, what the context was, et cetera. I know it's all work, it's all hard, it all takes time, but you know, the more people doing this, the better. And then upload your recording somewhere um, and make sure that, there, that it's a place that's gonna be permanent, that's gonna take your metadata and you know, give users the, the actual uh, locality, et cetera, because otherwise the, re the recordings and photos aren't very useful. And uh, also, you know, do playback experiments whenever possible. But these need to be carefully done, not just playing back and, you know, uh, seeing how, in order to be useful for science anyway, they need to be carefully done. Anecdotal information on playback is, can be useful, but it's just anecdotal. But actually doing experiments that give you information that is useful to understanding how the birds are perceiving uh, recordings of other taxa is, is quite a challenge <laughs> and, and it's rarely been under, undertaken uh, to everyone's satisfaction. Here's an example of birds that, have, that look about the same, have extremely different vocalizations and everyone knows that, <laughs> everyone that knows these birds knows how different they are. But Freeman and Montgomery finally did some experiments. There's only one way, it's got lots of issues, but still it showed pretty conclusively these birds don't consider each other to be the same species. And then don't keep it to yourself when you find out information, let people know, make, make, it, make people aware, make people that are working in the field aware. Um, and best is just to contact the taxonomists that you know may be working in that area, working on that region, or working on a global checklist, let them know. And, or put the information somewhere where they're gonna see it at least. So um, often though, collaboration can be arranged if there's uh, value in that. We do have lots of cases where taxonomic problems can be addressed with material that's already available. Here's an example of a recent split, the Philippine version of the Savannah nightjar, Griciatus, that was shown pretty clearly to be vocally different from the other two. Now the authors had a different interpretation that, that there were three different vocal groups. There are, but the main difference is between Philippine and everything else. So, so this one has been split, um, and this was basically largely on the basis of citizen science recordings. A lot of cases we need more data, maybe just a little more data. Here's a case of the, uh, the peewee, the Lesser Antillean peewee that has three different subspecies normally recognized. One clearly distinct in Puerto Rico, um, one in the three islands, three middle islands of, of uh, the Lesser Antilles and one in St. Lucia that's very different uh, in color anyway. And local people call them the Puerto Rican Peewee and the Lesser Antillean Peewee and the uh, um, St. Lucia Peewee because they know they're different. But taxonomists haven't quite got there yet because we're still missing the key recordings from those central islands. There's one from Guadalupe. I played it over and over again when I was in Dominica and Guadalupe and Martinique, never got a response. But the vocal birder that I was in contact with knew that was the recording. And, I mean, that was the song of those birds. 
and that they don't sing the same as Puerto Rican birds or St. Lucia birds. But still, we need proof, right? So we need more recordings. Now there's one from Dominica, this one here in the middle. But still, that's just two recordings online from the central uh, Lesser Antilles. It shouldn't be that hard. Somebody can do that. And then we can just solve this. It, it's really straightforward how different they are in Puerto Rico and the Lesser Antilles. Just need that key last bits of data. <clears throat> well, as I mentioned, birders are typically pretty interested in splits, uh, maybe re resentful of lumps, but anyway, um, that's because that means that you've got to go see it, right? So um, if birds are not split, that tends to lead to a lack of interest. Like most people, go to Dominica probably don't really seek out the house wren, even though it's really different, sings really different. Um, it still hasn't been split because it's complicated um, to split the whole house wren um, complex. Um, and same with the Galapagos barn owl or, this, or even the uh, barn, barn owl on, on uh, Dominica. They need to be split in my opinion, but the data really aren't very strong yet. And um, most birders aren't going to be keyed in on going to see them. So I, if they do get split, that's going to increase the number of opportunities for, for local guides, that's going to increase the uh, economic importance of those preserving those areas. Um, but we can't let that, those kinds of considerations drive taxonomy. <clears throat> well, so the future, I can't tell you what, uh, <laughs> what citizen science is going to be like in the future because we've got AI to contend with, we've got all kinds of amazing uh, developments and it, everything is just exponentially increasing and and uh, getting better um, but it will it the opportunities are there you can be as involved as you want to be um, of course we know that many species are not going to be around much longer we already have cases of whole families in this case going extinct this is the Kauai Oo the, some of the last individuals terrible photos uh, but still, that's all we've got. And uh, good recordings of amazing songsters that people were trying to save, but it didn't work. Uh, so, you know, you might be documenting birds that are going to go extinct. So, better to do it than not, right? And uh, I, I hate to be a downer there, but anyway. Um, anyway, so there's still a, a ton of work to be done on taxonomy. Uh, and you can make a big difference with even sometimes just a small amount of media. Just, you know, if you get the right species or the right tax that can make a big difference. You can influence taxonomic change. Uh, make sure it counts. Make sure that you contribute. So you may have a huge backlog of, infra of lists and recordings and photos that you haven't put anywhere because it's just so daunting. But you can start, and that'll be better than not starting, right? So, um, so anyway, uh, thank you, and, and I want to thank I'm sure I've forgotten to put a whole bunch of people, but this is like thousands of people that I'm acknowledging here, and everybody can contribute. So, thank you. Right, Pam, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. And so, uh, I can open the floor to questions. I've got one question just to start us off. I just wondered, what's your feeling on the pros and cons of competing checklists at the moment? Well, they're being aligned, so they won't be, com they're not really competing now, they're, yeah. um, they're, they're collaborating. So it's getting, the differences are, are getting less and less. Right. Yeah. Okay. So you think that we will gradually unify? Well, yes, it, but on the other hand, you never know when a new one will start up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's and then the Howard and Moore is, you know, on their own trajectory, so. All right. But I actually, I'm not that, I mean, I think that some differences of opinion reflect reality. I mean, we're talking yeah. about processes that, you know, that natural processes that don't have a clear cutoff point between species and not. And so, you know, there's some benefit to reflecting reality there. Precisely. Yeah, it's interesting to say about areas that have been looked at. Are you in the process of trying to map them out? Um, 
I'm pretty sure that there are people on eBird on the eBird team who are looking at that, but I I can't tell you, I can't give you any specifics. But it's it's definitely something that that people are looking at. So, yes. Oh boy, um, the more individuals, the better, and the more sites, the better. Um, but you know, it doesn't really take many if they're very, very different, which is what I suspect they are. But um, you know, it's it's hard to say what's what's a good sample size, but at least several of each. If depends on the the vocabulary. If it's a very complex vocabulary. Probably not for these peewees. It's probably a couple of main song types. Um, but yeah, the more the better. <laughs> no, because you've got some species that are, you know, just terrifically complex. And, and if, it's, um, if it's widely distributed with many, many taxa, then you need a whole lot more. Um, but like this, uh, the, the striped woodhunter example, it's probably more complicated than that, but there's just a very, very clear dichotomy between those Central American and South American groups. And yet there's always going to be more to fill in. It's widely distributed, lots of taxa involved in lots of cases. And, uh, you know, if you, but if you, wait, if you wait until we have sap good samples for every, every population, well, That'll be decades, or maybe they'll be gone. So not not the striped wood haunter, but you know. So yes. How problematic are misidentifications? Oh, they are problematic. So you always have to be aware of that. You always always have to go through and check. And you'll you know just when you find a misidentification, report it. There are they are there. People, this is citizen science. People are not everybody knows everything, and even people that do know everything or think they know everything don't. So. There are going to be misidentifications. When I was doing the crow work, um, there were so many. There are only two species of crows, and everyone thought they had the wrong one. So anyway, <laughs> two species in that island. I mean, I guess it was Cuba, yeah. So I was thinking about this issue that you brought up, where you have all these birders going to these places, and they're taking their checklists, and they're logging the species that they're saying, because they're not getting the data that you need. You need a song recording of this seemingly common thing from this locality. And I'm also thinking about how successful eBird has been. You know, it's really just blossomed this wonderful app. And I think part of that is because it's the ease at which it is to contribute data. So, um, you know, you go to a new, new place, you download a checklist, and they'll okay, here's all the birds that are going to be here. They'll tell you things like, there's no, um, there, you know, this thing's rare, or this thing, it might be. Why not create a feature on the app that says media needed for this? That's a great idea. I, don't, I assume that probably that has been suggested, but I don't know that. But like why if, don't... if I went to a place and said, oh, we need a sound recording of a house run from here, like, oh, yeah, well, no problem. I'm happy to get that. I think that that might be a way to. That's a really great idea. And again, it's pro I'll, I'll try to suggest it. But again, if you suggest it, that's even better. And, and <laughs> it may. It may be that it's on the list, you know, the to-do list already. I don't know. I know it's a long to-do list for eBird. I've asked them to do some things, you know, but they got a huge backlog. So. Okay. Anyone else? I'm oh, sorry, David. Can I just ask the audience a question? How many people here regularly use eBird? Um, I don't think they envision it, <laughs> last I knew. But anyway, I, I don't know any details. So, No, I mean, if there was some way of, of uh, more crosstalk without actual, you know, ingestion is the word that this used. Uh, I don't know. I mean, there's all kinds of possibilities. When we first started. Mm -hmm. so, you know, mm -hmm. Would there be an interest in marrying mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of interest there, this wasn't resource on us. Right. Yeah, it would be a big a big uh, ask for them, big lift.
Thanks, Thomas. Hi again, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the cup of tea. Uh, just before I introduce Siam, I'm going to introduce you to someone else. Uh, Emma, would you like to stand up for a moment? Um, Emma Abel joins us today, and Emma is the talented lady who has created these wonderful mosaics. Um, she'll be happy to explain all the details to you, but the key thing to note is if you buy one, then OBC, uh, Emma has generously offered uh, a percentage of the sale to go to OBC's conservation fund. So every mosaic you buy uh, go, helps OBC. You'll notice there's a fabulous masked fin foot specially themed for Siam's talk today. It's all carefully thought out and the dots are joined together. Um, so for the first time ever, you are head of the Christmas present season game. All you need to do is see Emma and grab one afterwards. So that's Emma. Do please uh, have a word with her afterwards if you would like uh, to talk about one of the mosaics. Right, thank you, Emma. Uh, time for our next talk. Um, Siam Chowdhury is a conservation biologist, ornithologist, nature photographer, and storyteller. He has a particular interest in the ecology and conservation of threatened species in Asia. Siam is an expert on that key habitat, the intertidal mudflats of Asia. Uh, we support more than 50 million migratory birds, including 33 globally threatened species. Siam's work is primarily focused on migratory shorebirds of the East Asian Australasian flyway and developing tools for managing coastal habitats and identifying mitigation measures in response to climate change is a key focuses. He's currently working on a PhD focusing on understanding the habitat requirements of these shorebirds in the coastal areas of Bangladesh and the multiple factors driving their population decline. Siam's work aims to identify the most effective long-term conservation measures for these species, their ecosystems, and the communities that depend on them. Siam's most significant conservation impact has been finding, researching, and lobbying to create a new coastal protected area in Bangladesh. Today, he joins us to talk about an iconic Asian species, which is a key focus this year for the Oriental Bird Club, the enigmatic masked finfoot. So please join me in welcoming Siam as he poses the poignant question, can we still save the masked finfoot? Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. That, that was a long introduction. I don't think I needed that long introduction. But can you hear me well um, like this? It's great. That's much better for me if I walk around, I feel free. Um, so yeah, as Chris said, I'm, I'm a PhD student at the University of Cambridge, but my focus for my PhD is shorebirds. But today I will talk to you about a different species, uh, musk finfoot. But sadly, I don't bring you very good news. Uh, it's going to be a bit grim, but uh, I will end with some hope. And hopefully, I'll come back after 10 years with some good news. And I'm also a council member of the Oriental Bird Club, one of the first Asians um, in the council, council, and also conservation officer for, for Bangladesh. So as you know, there are three finfoot species in the world. Uh, the American finfoot, which is known as sun grip, and the African finfoot, I just missed it in Rwanda. I really wanted to see it, but I didn't see it. Um, and the Asian finfoot, which is uh, also musk finfoot. Um, so the different um, about the uh, musk finfoot is it's one of the only migratory species of all finfoot species, which probably makes it more threatened than the other finfoot. And uh, last a few years ago, we did an assessment, and based on that, we came up with the population estimate of between 100 and 300 mature individuals, which is really low, much lower than what we had expected, uh, and based uh, uh, compared to the previous population estimate. Um, so previously, the musk finfoot was thinly distributed throughout Southeast and South Asia. But when we took a closer look in 2020, we found that it's, it's not as good as uh, we thought it is. 
and we looked at um, sighting uh, frequencies in Southeast Asia, uh, also in other countries, like all the countries where we had recent sightings from. And as you can see that the, there's a clear decline between uh, the year 2000 um, and you see an uh, increase in Cambodia because there was targeted survey in certain areas and more people were looking for it. So there's, there's like an increase there. But actually, it's, it's a very clear that there was, there was a huge decline going on in recent years in all these countries. Um, and there is another thing that is interesting about the FinFood because uh, the, where I work is, is the Sundarbans in Bangladesh, which is the largest mangrove forest in the world. And population there is resident. So when I tell my friends back home that FinFood is actually a migrant, they're, they're really surprised because they never, they're, I have never seen FinFood give, uh, you know, doing a big flight. It, it was always like uh, swimming in the water. Um, but in, in Southeast Asia, in these areas where they breed, when the water level drops within uh, wetlands inside the forest, they have to migrate because it's, it's dry. So they migrate farther down around here. Um, and that's possibly also one of the reasons why they are so rare and threatened. <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you a little bit about more, uh, more about my work that I have done in Bangladesh almost a decade ago, in uh, between 2011 and 13. It was funded by the Ruford Foundation. Also, I got a small grant from OBC uh, in later years. And it was only a few thousand pounds, and I wanted to serve the entire Sundarbans. Which was, um, which was obviously ambitious, but I didn't really know how to begin this um, survey, and uh, it was really challenging. But hey, we, we got some results, and it's now being used. So I'm going to play a, a short video of, of, of my uh, expeditions uh, back in 2011. Um, and it's, I have to warn you, it's like a really old video, so it might not be as great in quality. So before we did the surveys, we, we had a, a really good paper that was published in Forktail, um, which is now Journal of Asian Ornithology by OBC. Um, it, was, it was a survey done by photographers back in 2004, and they published their observations, which was the basis of my survey. Um, and when I was doing those surveys, I also spoke to local fishermen quite a lot, and they actually had guided me towards my first nest when I was doing, like, first two weeks I spent looking for the nest without really understanding how to find one, and we got really frustrated after not finding any nest for three weeks. So the fishermen really helped us with, with their knowledge to find nests. And then we finally found these two chicks, um, which gave us a little hope that we will find uh, a nest. In the end, we did find a nest, and we monitored the nest using camera traps for the first time when we got a lot of interesting insights on fin foot incubation and basic ecology. And we saw that most, most of the incubation duties are, the female is, is doing most of these and the male is at, actually had left the nest 10 days before the chick had fledged, which was really interesting, but we only have like one pair that we had um, this data from. Later on, I put like more camera traps, but one of the nests got uh, like we had six eggs, and all, the, all those eggs were eaten by a changeable hawk eagle, so we, didn't, we lost that chance. Um, and I used a floating height like this uh, on a boat 20 meters from the nest, and I was um, in, a, in the height from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, inside the forest where we have man-eating tigers. And when I was starting my PhD, I had to do a risk assessment for my university. Um, and I was like, okay, I have broken all these rules well before I started a PhD. <laughs> so this is a male um, input, which really dark throat. And this is from the height. So it, uh, it really was um, my greatest fin food uh, sightings ever. And this was during monsoon, so there was a lot of rain. So, and this is a female. So we took some notes on, on their diet and we found that they are primarily dependent on small crabs and shrimp. These are the two things they uh, mostly feed on.
And this was, you, you're going to see that in a minute. This just completely blew my mind when I saw that female walking up the trunk of a tree where to its nest. It will come in a sec. This. <laughs> this is amazing. I couldn't believe it. So the nest is basically quite, um, if so we had our camera trap just there, kind of 1.5 meters above the nest. Um, the nest would be usually on the overhanging branches. And during high tide, it, it could actually, uh, it would be like two meters above high tide level. So they could jump into water if there's any danger. And I think this was one of my best fin food moments. Um, because it rained all day, it was still raining, and during low tide, both male and female foraged together, and then they vanished into the distance. <laughs> yeah, so the male left the nest 10 days before the chicks got hatched, which was interesting, and we don't really have any other sample size to understand. And while we are um, uh, working around the nest, we also took some samples of local fish, um, and spoke to uh, fishermen as well to understand the psychology a little better. This was the hide, floating hide. And we had, um, this is the one, one day old chick. So two chicks got hatched uh, from that nest. Yeah, it's really cute. But can't beat spoonbills and piper chicks. <laughs> Right, so during this surveys, we also spoke to fishermen, as I said, and we, we asked them if they uh, have ever hunted fin food, and at least 60% of them have tasted musk fin food meat at least once in their lifetime, which was a big problem. And part of the reason is that they, they use this, it's locally called chorpata fishing, which is basically they put the nets, fishing nets, all along uh, small creeks. So when they're trying to set up the nets to discover the nests, because Finford also build a nest along the creeks, right? So they come back at night during high tide when the, when the water level is really high and you could, if you stand on a boat, you could actually grab, uh, you could get to the nest quite easily. So then they use a flashlight to temporarily blind the adult incubating bird and they take the eggs, sometimes the adults as well, which was really new information for us. Um, and it was, it was astonishing. So here we compared our surveys with the 2004 surveys, um, and we did three years of survey after that. Um, and we found some um, interesting differences because the preference for tree for nesting was quite different in 2004. They mostly preferred sundari, which is one of the common trees in the sundar ones. But when we did the surveys, it was quite different. And the habitat preference was also slightly different. Uh, but the main problem, is this. So the, the, these are the 2004 nests, these triangles, and all the stars of the nest that we found. So I, when I started my survey, I started from here, and I spent two weeks looking for a nest, but didn't find any nest, because the re previous re reports are all here. And uh, as we started to move north, we started to find nest. Um, so that was pretty clear that birds from here had disappeared, at least the breeding pairs. So we, don't, we didn't really know why, but then we looked into different um, aspects of water quality, like saltwater intrusion and lack of freshwater flow. Um, um, so I, we think, and also there were like a couple of cyclones post 2005, which might have wiped out the population from the coast. So it's all kind of linking towards the impact of climate change, but we really don't have enough data to, to really prove it or disprove it. But we, we hopefully we will we can we can tell more about it in the near future. But definitely there has been a northward shift of the fin food breeding population at least. Um, zooming out, so if you so when I was working in Bangladesh, we after that we decided to look at it in what's happening in other countries, and in every literature I read, it was like Myanmar is the hotspot of the species. Like you have a big number of individuals there. But when we really looked into Myanmar, there was like, we found that there's large scale deforestation that happened, especially in 
Hukong Valley area. And even targeted surveys, uh, including camera traps, failed to detect any fin foot in recent years. So basically, that's, even if there is any fin foot left there, would be very small in numbers. So if, if, if you consider the global population, if you exclude Myanmar, then obviously only Bangladesh is other country where you have a big number of fin foots. Um, and then we uh, published this paper in Parktail uh, in 2020, which then led uh, the species to become critically endangered, which is bad news, but also good news in a way that we could now push the policy and also our donors to do something about this bird, which is going to vanish if we don't do anything. So we, um, so this table is based on recent reports, um, also expert opinion, because in many of these places, we don't really have any quality survey report, so we had to rely on expert opinion. And compiling all of that, we couldn't come up with more than 300 metro individuals. And it really comes down to these seven sites in four countries, where Bangladesh is leading, and then we have Cambodia, where we still know there are breeding populations. Um, and then if you, if you look at this map, you see this, these are the main areas of input where we still have some breeding population. And then if you look at this map, is all this deforestation is also overlapping in the fin food habitat. So we already knew that you know, in Asia we have um, deforestation problems. But the saddest thing is that even in protected areas, fin foods are not safe. So there are people, uh, fishermen collecting eggs and adults from the nests. And there are problems with different fishing methods, like people use uh, um, poison, and there are like different kinds of fishing that, has, that, are, that are detrimental for fin food, and all, many other water dependent species. <clears throat> so the question is, can we still do something about it? I personally believe that we still have a chance to turn the tide around for fin food, and we listed a number of activities that we should be doing in the next couple of years to, uh, to, to kind of stop, uh, halt the decline uh, for a few. Um, so one of these important things is to identify important hotspots uh, that is uh, also breeding and non-breeding within the Sudamans of Bangladesh, because it's a huge area. The entire forest, including Indian part, is 10,000 10, square kilometers. In Bangladesh, we have 6,000 square kilometers. But these are the areas where, where we, we think the fin food range is. And we need to identify all these important sites within this big national park, because then we can have targeted protection uh, interventions. Uh, and then we have to work with the local uh, community and the government so that they own the species. Because when you talk about uh, conservation in Sundarbans or in Bangladesh, we always talk about the tiger. Now we have more focus on dolphins, so it's always dolphin than tiger, but no one really knows about the wind food. People didn't know when I started working, when I applied for a permit, they didn't know what species is this. So I had to go and explain, like, this is a threatened species that we have in our forest. Please give me a permit to work on it. Um, but now, since 2011, things have changed a little bit. Um, the government now acknowledged that there is an important species apart from taiga uh, that is uh, important for this ecosystem. Uh, but we need to do a lot more work so we can have at least some creeks um, that are dedicatedly protected for finfoot. Um, and also we have to set up a long-term monitoring scheme so we can see the changes of our conservation inter interventions, if it's happening or not, plus climate change impact, and if we can do something about that at all. And then in other countries, we truly, truly need to do some targeted surveys uh, especially in Myanmar and Cambodia. There are work going on in Cambodia at the moment by WCS, which is fantastic. We have just been, uh, we just installed some sound recording devices in the forest, and they have detected finfoot call as well. So that's, that's pretty good, but we have more sites to cover, uh, and maybe some targeted survey in Myanmar would also be quite useful to see what's happening in the ground. Because, you know, if you don't really look for the bird um, during, during the right season, then you don't really see it because it's, it's elusive and it's, it's rare and it's quite shy. So you have to really target it um, to find it. Um, so if you want to see a fin food, I know most of you are birders, and if you want to see it, uh, Shundabans in Bangladesh is the place to see it. We are already 
uh, um, organizing bird tours with Bird Tour Asia, and some of the profit goes to the local conservation projects, and most of it will go into finfoot conservation in in uh, in the coming years. And you can you can go to the website and find the tour details if you want to join. And uh, as Chris explained, that mask finfoot is OBC's priority species now, so. Please help um, and go to the OBC donation page uh, to donate for Finfoot, or you can write to mail at orientalbirdclub.com um, if you if you are willing to help us uh, turn the tide around for this species. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Sam. Any questions for Siam? Yeah. Siam. Please. It's well. It's a, it's a it's disturbance, right? So there are many forms of disturbance. Even tourists going into a creek is disturbance. But the main problem is the fishing, where they find the nest and they target the nest and then take the eggs. So that's much bigger. But overall, disturbance obviously one of the problems, and that's why we need to identify all the important tricks so no one can really enter, except for us. <laughs> Is it possible this northward movement is, is in relation to them being poached out in the southern area? Is that where the central population is? Or? Um, possible, but you know, so there are so many nests that they found, but we didn't find any. And suddenly we started finding nests after a certain area, yeah. which was quite surprising. And you know, we could only think of saltwater intrusion or recent cyclones mm. uh, as possible reasons. But yeah, that could be one as well. We don't know. Sure. Uh, the impression I get is the species only occurs in a relatively limited area of the coastal cinderbar. Is that due to human pressure or is it due to habitat features? That it's it? basically freshwater area. So in the eastern part of the Sutta ones, you have more freshwater where you get pinfoot. And that's why we think that the saltwater intrusion is possibly pushing the bird further, further north where you have more freshwater. <coughs> And in the Indian part, you don't have any finfoot because that's more saline. So as you go east from west, you see less and less finfoot. And many other species, uh, the composition completely changes, including vegetation composition. Yeah. Yeah. It's not the lack of salinity. So, so, yeah. It's, so, so with sea level rise, you have salinity going into the forest, and then you also have lots of dams and freshwater extraction in the upstream, which is reducing the freshwater flow in, within inside the forest. So pressure from both sides, really, yeah. Has anybody even looked at, well, this is a long shot, uh, a captive breeding program? Well, we, <laughs> we tried to find if there's any captive population in the world, there isn't any. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the last resort. But I, I suspect it would be quite challenging because they have very specific habitat requirements, but I guess not impossible. Yeah, when you talk to the fishermen about the efforts of conservation for these birds, what's their attitude to changing historical attitudes and cultural views, eating them? I mean, to be honest, they don't really need to take it because it's opportunistic. They're not dependent on it. Um, and some of them did say like they, they're okay to not harm it, um, but I think we need some kind of like long-term campaign and education so that they know. Also, a little bit of um, enforcement so that they know that what they're doing is illegal. It's actually illegal. You can't kill any bird in, Bang in our in Bangladeshi law, so it's illegal. So there, so there are two things that we should we should be doing. Basically. You say in the same time, it's pretty settled in Kuma Creek. Yeah. And are there Don't know. I never had any pin put in hand, but oh, maybe right. others could say more about it. But yeah, we Did, didn't see any apparent difference. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it's something to look into in the future. Yeah. 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 That's quite fascinating. Yeah. You had a question. 
I'm just going to ask about engagement with the fishermen and whether or not there is a way to get them on board with supporting and seeing this as a major yeah. uh, <coughs> part of their role to help. Yeah, that's a, so that's one of the activities that we should be doing immediately, right? So in, in our actions, we, we listed that as well. Because when I, when I was doing my work, it was mostly research. I didn't get into conservation interventions, but now we really have to, we're losing time. So that's, that's, we are planning that as well. That's part of the big plan. And is, is ecotourism a, a part of the, the solution, do you think? Is, could enough money come in from ecotourists wanting to see Finfoot to make a difference? I mean, it, we have to like direct the fund, um, in, in, find a way to direct it towards the local communities because the big companies that we depend on um, that they, they, they're really detached from the forest because yeah. they it does, doesn't really go into the local uh, communities. So the big companies that are based in the cities, they get the money, but the, the locals don't really get it. So we need a fin foot day and a, and a how to go <laughs> we fishing have to day. Find a way <laughs> to get to the people who are actually using those creeks. Yeah. Um, and it's so vast, and the people. So when I was doing the interviews, I was also asking which village they're from. And they would say villages that are like 100 kilometers north. Yeah. So it was quite hard to like target uh, villages where these different people are coming from. But I think we need more work and understanding what, what, what their villages are so we can then go to these villages and then talk about the conservation. What's the national bird about the fish? Met by Robin. Or into <laughs> Met by Robin. Could you start a campaign to meet the <laughs> <laughs> Well... If it's going extinct, then probably not. But yeah. that's why we're here. We have to stop it. Yeah, John. Can you just talk a little bit about the, the next steps? What, what's going to happen next and where the funding is going to come from? Yeah, so, we, so there, there is a um, convention or partnership called East Asia Australasia Flyer Partnership, where, which involves a lot of the countries in Asia, in uh, Southeast and South Asia. Um, and we are starting a task force uh, called the Mass Input Task Force, under which we plan to do um, several activities. One of which uh, is that we, we want to focus primarily in Bangladesh. Um, and then, uh, as I said, like we have to identify the key sites and then get those protected. So that's, that would be the major two um, main activity in the next few years. And funding, we don't really have any concrete funding yet, but OBC has, is on board and we are, we are working on it. And uh, yeah, we need quite a bit of funding in the next couple of years to, to make a big difference because small scale service won't really do much difference now. We need something big and we need to show it to the government that we have surveyed like all the creeks in the Eastern Sundarbans and we need 20, these 20 creeks are the important creeks, we need to protect it. So. To get to that level, we, we need to do large scale, and Sundarbans is quite expensive because it's boat based. So you have to hire a boat, will, and crew, and yeah. So. so it is the species is a key focus for OBC this year. One of the reasons for that you saw on Siam's very first slide, the the new population estimates are terrifying. So this is a bird that in my lifetime, in the 1990s, I'd go to Thailand birding. You'd expect you'd have to look for them, but if you were lucky, you'd expect to maybe see a fin foot in Thailand, in, in Tamanagar, at Malaysia, there aren't any modern records, not yeah. recent records. The, the birds are gone. So this is the species that is going extinct very, very quickly, and we're going to have to take major action. OBC is not a big charity, but we can at least help with the, the start of the conservation. So that's why we, we're putting a key focus on, on Finfoot as a, a key focus species this year, because the speed it's happening at is, is yeah. horrifying. Sundermans is probably our last chance, you know, really to... Yeah, maybe Cambodia as well. Yeah, Cambodia too, yeah. yeah. Just another quick idea. Um, all the fishermen on the, on the three platters I saw were wearing T-shirts. You can get T-shirts made very cheaply, I think. Yeah. What about the idea of having a, you know, mask and foot T-shirt given to the fishermen? If you're wearing a T-shirt with a bird on, you're not likely to read it. I mean, Chris won't even hit it, will you? <laughs> I, I have been offered, actually. I'll tell you later, but no. It's a bit different in the global south, but uh, we can, yeah. It's a good idea. We always use T-shirts um, to get to people. It's the sort of thing that might be funded by somebody who's not actually necessarily a bird. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. 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 Are there any other NGOs coming in behind this? I mean, we've got some money, but <laughs> well, well, so bird life uh, is on board, but we all know how that functions. Uh, so we really have to take things on our hands and move on with it. 
Um, we have a clear idea of what to do in, in Bangladesh. Um, and I think WCS Cambodia is doing quite a bit of work and they're on it. So we don't really have to focus there. And what I'm, I'm really keen to see, like check some of the sites in Southeast Asia, like in Laos, in Myanmar, if we can get that. Um, so that would be like small scale surveys, which wouldn't require a lot of money to check those and organize surveys and then see if there is any viable population where we can focus conservation. Right. Yeah, Myanmar is also a, yeah. an issue. I mean, OBC has been trying to spend some of our money in Myanmar to save the last population of Gurney's Pitta for the last two or three years. It's just simply impossible to spend money there and, and get a, a good result at the moment. Um, meanwhile, the deforestation that's occurring in Myanmar is similarly yeah. uh, rapid. Um, we work with Bird, OBC has been trying to work with BirdLife Local Partners in Myanmar, specifically on Gurney's Pitta. Um, because uh, bird life had found a big population there just as the Thai population was going functionally extinct. Um, most of the forest in which they found those Gurney's bitters is now gone. So obviously the same forest is going to be under pressure for, for fin feet as it is for Gurney's. But working in Myanmar is, is far from easy for a host of reasons. So Bangladesh is certainly our best chance in the short term, Bangladesh and Cambodia to, to do so. Yeah, I agree. Uh, any other questions from anyone else? If not... I'm going to suggest we break for lunch. You are free to do whatever you would like for lunch. There is the kitchen downstairs that I think has yeah. sandwiches and snacks and that kind of stuff. Right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back. Thanks for rejoining us. Um, just before I introduce our glamorous next speaker, I would like to point out how stylishly I am dressed today. <laughs> Um, I bet you're thinking, I wish I looked that fashionable. Well, the good news is you can. This is the new OBC Nine Pitters t-shirt. Uh, Billy Roger, where's Billy? Stand up, please, Billy. This is Billy, in charge of sales for OBC. Billy is your man. He can help you today to get one of these fabulous t-shirts. It's available in multiple sizes. If you don't buy them today, panic not. They're also available on eBay. You search within eBay Oriental Bird Club and you will find the OBC merchandise. Make sure it's the real OBC. But everything is available on your local eBay, uh, including uh, just arrived for me, the Paris or Milan, I forget which, the OBC baseball caps. Um, Billy may also mention to you the new leech socks, which are Europe's best-selling leech socks uh, <laughs> out of a group of two, I think. But anyway, we, you know, we are number one. Uh, you can see all of these just outside there. Have a chat with Billy. He will happily sell you any of the above on eBay, if not. Um, Billy may also mention we're planning a second Pitta design t-shirt for 2024. So similar design, but different species, as well as a new limited edition yellow-breasted bunting pin badge, limited edition, coming next year. Uh, all the profits of all this merchandise goes to OBC's conservation work. So we are volunteer-based. We have no staff, no paid staff, no offices. Every cent we earn basically goes to conservation. Um, and if you're not a member yet, did I mention the first off? Do please join orientalbirdclub.org forward slash join. We need you as members. So Mike Edgecombe, I've known Mike for a long time. Uh, Mike is a long time member and former chairman himself of OBC. He has many years of experience birding throughout Asia and beyond and has visited almost every country in the Oriental region. His status as a recently retired dental surgeon, brackets high end, close brackets, means that he has finally has the time to travel to more far-flung places and see even more birds that I have never seen. He recently returned from a trip to Mongolia where he saw some mouth-watering sights and made some interesting discoveries, which I am not allowed to mention. He joins us today to share the highlights from that trip. So please join me in welcoming Mike as he talks on Mongolia, birds and more in Asia's wild wilderness. Well, well, thank you, Chris, for that kind intro. Um, it's always the, the awkward slot, isn't it? The graveyard after lunch. Uh, and so, Chris, uh, thank you for picking me to do this slot. Uh, and it's usually reserved for someone who can uh, magically stop eyelids from closing and keep everyone's attention. Uh, so it's going to be a fast-paced talk, this. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy it, and you'll be the judges of whether I've managed to keep you all awake. Uh, I, I'm sort of also honoured to be uh, speaking amongst uh, quite uh, 
uh, esteemed colleagues in that uh, all the other speakers uh, are doctorates or close to being doctorates and, and I'm only an honorary one by virtue of taking a few teeth out. Um, and in fact, it's also an honour being back here at the Natural History Museum. I enjoyed it this lunchtime, uh, pottering round, and gave me a chance to actually to have a look at the development of the human skull, um, which I hadn't done for over 45 years. Uh, and it was quite exciting. And I shared this excitement of looking at the dental anatomy of different skulls with James Eaton and Alex Berryman at lunchtime. And uh, I looked at them, and they looked blankly back at me, and it made me realise I shouldn't talk about teeth, but I should just stick to birds. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I'm going to take you on a little tour uh, of Mongolia, where I was uh, um, lucky enough to visit earlier this year in the, in the spring, uh, and uh, it really get to grips with this country and see if actually Asia is uh, one of uh, the last wilderness of Mongolia. Well, Mongolia is, is, as you probably all know, sandwiched between the great superpowers of Russia and China. Um, probably not uh, an enviable place to be in, in this political climate, but it is a stable country and a very safe country, as we were to find out. It's also one of the least populated countries in the world. Uh, its population per square kilometre, as you can see from that graph, is considerably lower than its neighbour, China. Uh, and it's also quite a severe continental climate, um, being nowhere near the sea, uh, it hasn't any maritime influences, uh, and it suffers from extremely cold winters, uh, temperatures regularly getting down to as low as minus 40, minus 50, and what little rainfall there is tends to be in the summer months. It is known as the, the land of the eternal blue skies by the Mongolians. Um, we didn't quite experience that, uh, but the average rainfall... Uh, it's in the desert, it's only about 42 millimetres. And even in the, the wetter north, the, the, uh, the, the forests there only receive about a third that of the, the boreal forests uh, of Europe. Um, and that gives rise to a number of ecological zones and habitats that are reflected by that precipitation. Most of the precipitation in the country comes from the, uh, the, the far north, the Arctic northerly winds. And so as you move south in the country, it becomes generally more arid and drier uh, and very dry, of course, in the southernmost Gobi Desert. It's also quite a high country at an average altitude of 1,500 metres, uh, with the highest peak over in the uh, uh, Mongol Altai range in the far west, uh, of 4,374 metres. So the altitude, again, uh, influences the, the general temperatures that one experiences. It's also got a number of important bird areas. Um, and during our travels, we would be visiting di lots of different habitats and experiencing lots of different avian delights. Uh, in fact, the IBAs cover about 5% uh, of the total land mass. So, we went in May of this year, uh, left sunny England behind um, and arrived in the capital Ulaanbaatar, which had been warned was quite a grey Soviet-style capital. And indeed, it was a very grey and wintry scene that uh, welcomed us uh, early in the morning with a temperature down to six degrees. Uh, it really didn't feel like spring or anywhere near summer when we arrived. Uh, and this was our general... Um, uh, route that we would take around Mongolia, starting in the capital, if I can get this to work, up here, Ulaanbaatar, we would track west through the steppe grasslands, up into the Kangai Mountains, through south through the Kangai Mountains, down to the sort of Great Mongolian Depression here, little excursion to the west, uh, and then visiting some uh, freshwater lakes and saline lakes, and then finally down to the Gobi Desert, uh, and the Gobi Altai Mountains, and then back to Ulaanbaatar and a bit more in the northeast there. So quite a long trip uh, in terms of the distances we were covering, but we were well equipped with uh, some wonderful uh, sturdy four-wheel drives with uh, huge tyres that enabled us to negotiate uh, the terrain very well. And we had very few problems, if any, with the, with the vehicles. But no sooner have you left Ulaanbaatar, uh, then you get an idea of the vastness of this country. Um, and don't be fooled by the tarmac road. Uh, blink and you've missed it. There are very few tarmac roads, so we enjoyed this for about an hour 
I think, or maybe a bit more driving out of Ulaanbaatar westwards, um, but it would be the last uh, tarmac road we would see for some time. Um, and as soon as we'd ventured from the, the, the capital, um, we started to see wildlife appearing, which was great. Uh, uh, we were lucky enough to come across a couple of herds of Mongolian gazelles, quite a rare gazelle, so we were lucky to find that early. And of course, our first typical birds of the Stepland, um, Mongolian lark, uh, uh, really one of my favourite larks, uh, like a cross between a calandra and a white wing lark, a really huge thing, uh, and those, those were pretty numerous. Uh, and birds of prey, um, pretty common in Mongolia. Um, this was a, a lovely amur falcon that we saw on our very first morning, uh, perched by the roadside, um, uh, feeding off posts. And uh, in fact, this was the, they're moving through, they're migrating through, they don't breed in Mongolia. Um, so they're migrating through. And this was the only site that we actually came across this species. And steppe eagles as well, very common uh, bird of prey, probably the commonest aquila uh, in, in Mongolia. Uh, and we got some wonderful views, close views of, of uh, the Nipolensis race, uh, which is only partially migratory compared to the Orientalis of, of the West. Um, so really wonderful to see. Our first major stop was at Hustai National Park to the west of Ulaanbaatar. Uh, this isn't famous for its bird life, although there are a few birds, uh, but it's famous for uh, the reintroduction of Prowalski's horse, uh, made, uh, was extinct in the wild, uh, and reintroduced to the park, I think, in the early 1990s. I might be wrong with that, but I think about that time. And now has a flourishing population of those. So we were particularly keen to see Prowalski's horse. But we were greeted with the sight of uh, other common mammals of Mongolia. The Mongolian or Tarbagan uh, marmot uh, was very numerous. We saw these virtually on a daily basis in the right sort of habitats. Uh, and the ground squirrel family as well was well represented, and this was a Dorian ground squirrel that we photographed from the car as well. And we soon came across a small herd of um, Prowalski's horse, uh, a really elegant horse, uh, and a very different uh, taxonomic lineage to, to the domesticated horse. Uh, I believe, actually, it's got 33 pairs of chromosomes, whereas domestic horse has 32. Uh, an interesting fact for you, but a really lovely horse, and we saw quite a few small groups of these on our journey around the park. But we also saw a few birds there. As I've said before, Mongolian lark uh, was very common, uh, probably best appreciated in flight, a uh, lovely wing pattern. Uh, and um, Asian short-toed lark was particularly common in these areas as well. Uh, a few golden eagles, and not as common as steppe eagle, but we saw those uh, on a regular basis throughout the trip, uh, giving some nice views. Um, and also, we were lucky enough to stumble across a, a Japanese quail, a female here that was spotted by one of the eager-eyed participants uh, from one of the vehicles. But it was uh, a rapid tour we were doing, and we had to move on and uh, move westwards. Uh, and eventually, we would come across uh, one of many uh, small wetlands, um, despite its very dry climate and arid climate, uh, uh, Mongolia is, is dotted with lots of wet, wetlands, bordered with uh, quite extensive Phragmites reed beds uh, and habitats. And as you can imagine, in that sort of arid country, these are a real magnet, not only for breeding birds, but for migratory birds as well. And so one of the nice birds we want, particularly wanted to see there was white nape crane, um, a, a real speciality of that area uh, here in their breeding, breeding uh, habitat. Uh, and also more familiar birds and more widespread species, such as bar-headed goose. And, uh, of course, swan goose was a particular target species to see. Uh, breeds uh, in Mongolia, winters South Korea, um, South China. Uh, but here they were breeding birds were present and quite a common, common bird in these uh, wetlands. Uh, and other Palearctic species that we're more familiar with, such as ruddy shell duck uh, and perhaps the... Uh, uh, the most notable crane species of Central Asian Mongolia, the beautiful Demoiselle crane. Uh, we saw lots of these uh, uh, in, the, in the fields as we drove along, so we got plenty of nice views of those. And uh, eastern marsh harriers as well, with the dominant raptor over the reed beds uh, and uh, breeding in this site. But there was one particular bird at this lake that we wanted to find, uh, and that was 
Palace's rebunting of the Lydiae race, um, which uh, hopefully will be split uh, into Mongolian bunting. It's a subtly different song to the nominate Palace's rebunting, uh, and as you can probably appreciate from that photograph, um, it's also a, a much browner and, and uh, rustier bird than the, uh, the greyness of the nominate Palace's reed bunting. Uh, these were also breeding in, in quite an interesting habitat. They're in the bushes rather than anywhere near the reed beds, unlike our Eurasian reed bunting. But there were lots of migrants as well. Waders were beginning to pour through on their way up to the Arctic. So we saw lots of nice summer plumage, long-toed stints, uh, really nice bird to see, as well as summer plumage temic stints. Asian dowitches, we saw a few of those, curlew sandpipers, all in resplendent plumages. So it was you could spend hours at these lakes and, and, and find new birds all the time. Um, but we had to press on westwards uh, and head up into the Kangai Mountains in the northwest. And this was the scene that sort of greeted us. It, it was a very wintry, sparse-feeling uh, forest with, with the Siberian larch, which is the dominant tree there, hardly in leaf at all. But that late spring that they'd experienced and, and uh, delayed spring, really, uh, worked to our advantage, as you will see. So we set up camp, or rather our crew set up our camp for us. We were well looked after. Uh, lovely food was cooked for us in the mess tent, and uh, we enjoyed uh, uh, great hospitality from our, from our ground agents. The forest I found quite interesting. I was expecting to experience really pristine forest, but in fact a lot of the forest was obviously heavily cut over, uh, degraded in places, and it, it made one think, you know, are the birds threatened here at all? Um, but nevertheless, we set off and ventured into the forest on foot, uh, and lots of familiar Western Palaeoptic species here, such as siskin, brambling, hawfinch, long-tailed tit, all good ticks for those uh, oriental listers. Um, but one of the commonest birds, and a real pleasure to see, was the lovely pine bunting. Really common bird in the forest, singing away, just like a yellow hammer, very similar to yellow hammer. Um, and so we saw lots of these with lots of photographic opportunities. And red-throated thrush was the... Uh, dominant thrush as well. Um, the, despite the late spring, we still came across them and they're already feeding young. Uh, this one had a nest in that crevice in the, in the tree there. And tiger flycatchers as well were very, very common in these uh, woodlands. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get a photograph of the lovely male. Uh, this is a female. And uh, tree pipit, ordinary tree pipits, outnumbered olive back uh, considerably in the, these western. Uh, forest, and um, it was great to see those as well, uh, all singing away. Another familiar Palearctic species, such as black woodpecker, um, was pretty common, uh, grey-headed woodpecker. And the other family that's well represented in these forests was the red starts, and my particular favourite uh, was Eversman's red start, um, a really lovely male. They were a bit skittish, a bit shy, um, but we managed to get some fine views of that and Dorian red start in these forests. But these forests are all about a big bird. The real speciality that we wanted to see and the late spring played into our hands because these birds, the black bill capicale, were still lacking. And we were lucky enough on the two mornings we drove in to be able to have lecking males right by the cars uh, clucking away. A, a real experience that I would recommend to anyone, a fantastic bird to see. Uh, and the photograph in the dull light doesn't do that plumage justice. Uh, it really did glow in, in the dark of the forest there. So our time in the northern Kangai Mountains was over, and so we set off uh, south over the mountain range, and uh, the roads uh, left a lot to be desired. Uh, they weren't signposted. How the drivers knew where to go, I've got no idea. Um, but we, we, we battled south. It was a bumpy, bone-jarring journey, uh, sometimes uh, quite steep slopes. Uh, and when there wasn't a road, we, also, we always had a, a river to uh, drive along and find our way. And eventually, uh, we were heading to the southern area of the Kangai Mountains, the higher ranges, above 3,000 metres, to this place called Cut Lake. Uh, this is a quite a famous birding site. It's where most of the bird tours go. Uh, and the number of species that we particularly wanted to find here. 
Uh, and I was lucky enough when we parked our vehicles and standed, stand watching the scree slopes that I managed to pick out a couple of uh, um, Altai snowcock, which we enjoyed for a good half an hour uh, feeding on the grassy slope above us. One thing I should say about Mongolia is um, it's a windy place. It is known for a windy place. There's nothing to stop that air anywhere. And so often when using telescopes, you're really having to find shelter to try and hold them steady. It, it really can be exceedingly windy. And of course, slides don't portray that. Um, but we needed to climb higher up uh, above the lake to get up into the rocky slopes here for a number of uh, species. Uh, this is... Asian rosy finch of the Suskini race. Uh, again, potentially a split in, in the future, so we were keen to see that, uh, along with um, some of the more regular species that occur at these altitudes, such as Altai uh, Accenter and Brown Accenter. But there's one bird we struggled to find in, in the hour or two we were up there, and it was only because of uh, two men here on the right and his son who are ground agents and, and quite sharp-eyed and keen birders themselves actually found um, these would walk past them for some reason on the lower slopes. Uh, and that is the beautiful Hodgson's or white-throated bush chair. Uh, I thank James Eaton for this photograph. It's not my photograph. Uh, we found them very skittish and very difficult to get anywhere close to. They would often, uh, instead of flying from bush to bush, they'd fly 400 meters and then another 400 meters. Um, but uh, this is in one of their few breeding sites, um, a, a quite a rare bird now, um, and localised breeding in Mongolia. But we were constantly reminded that winter really hadn't lost its grip on us. And uh, as we drove further south, uh, away from the high mountains, the rivers were still partially frozen, uh, and the herders with their livestock were eking out a... a, a at their existence in, in really quite a harsh climate. I think, you know, considering we were the end of May, beginning of June, it was minus three, minus four here. So, uh, you know, a tough existence for the, the herders there. But we were constantly surrounded by birds, and some of the commoner birds that we would see on our trip was things like Dorian jackdaws and chuff in the background, and uh, upland buzzards were very common. And whenever there was settlements uh, and buildings, there'd always be the ever-present uh, black-eared kite. But we would leave the snowy mountains behind, head further south to warmer climes, we hoped, and uh, eventually it's a new tarmac road. Bliss, I can't tell you how much we enjoy having a smooth surface and not bone-jarring jumps and bars in the four-wheel drives. Uh, mm -hmm. The suspension lacked a little bit. They were very reliable, but... They were a rough ride. Uh, and of course, there's always a few birds to see as we stop to refuel or buy food, uh, such as these hill pigeons here with the grotty feral pigeon above. And always things of interest like the traditional gear or yurt camp that is so typical of the nomadic lifestyle of the Mongol people. Um, I'm not sure the, their big four-wheel drive park next to it is just a sign of the times or, or have they always had those? Um, I think at this stage I should also uh, just mention that this, this trip I was on was a, a scheduled bird tour run by Bird Tour Asia, uh, superbly organised and expertly led by, uh, this is Martin Kennywall, an Asia-based birder who some of you will know, uh, and he was really great fun to, to, to birdwatch and, and made with and made the trip a, a real pleasure. So I've got a lot to be thankful for for Martin. But uh, we had a long drive that day. We were heading down into the valley beyond, beyond there that you can uh, see uh, down here, heading down into the, to the, the lakes. And so immediately we got there, we put the scopes up and uh, decided to eat. Uh, refuel. And so in the mess tent, we were well fed. And once well fed and nourished, it was out on the scopes to scan this lake. This is Ignis Lake. It's over in the far west, the furthest west we would travel, uh, and an important breeding site uh, for one particular bird. But we needed to get out to the shore, and that meant donning these lovely green overwellies. Uh, I don't know why people don't make them in this country. They're brilliant. They just slip over your normal walking boots, and you can wade out into water and mud uh, and then take them off when you're finished. Uh, and on along the shoreline there, there was plenty of goals to be seen. Um, this is Mongolian gull, the Mongolicus race of herring gull. 
um, with its bright vermilion red orbital ring here, slightly paler mantle. Uh, and this one's quite a pink leg variation. Uh, some of them have yellow legs, I think. Uh, it's closely related to Vigagol, um, and it's rather than the Kakinems complex. Uh, and this was the common gull that you would see in those areas. But there was a particular gull we wanted to find. And we were lucky enough to come across uh, a nice flock of bathing um, relic gulls in the breeding plumage finery. Uh, and these were floating around on the edge of the shore, giving us lovely views totally unperturbed by our presence, so we could get quite close to them. And now and again, one would fly past, uh, and you, we could really appreciate uh, the delicate plumage of the wing pattern there. A really super gull, and, and one bird I particularly wanted to see. Uh, there were a few other birds around these uh, saline lakes, uh, and in the freshwater flows into that, uh, we had some really fantastic views of uh, familiar species, uh, such as this Slovonian grebe, or horned grebe, uh, feeding right next to an eared or black neck grebe. So that was, that was really nice to see. Um, and one other bird that we were jammed in on uh, and were really lucky to find was the western yellow wagtail of the leucocephala race. Um, I, I did wonder whether this was a pure leucocephala. Um, hybrids between Beamer and Lutea do look a, can look a bit like this. But James had a look at this this morning and assured me it's as good as you get. So it's nice to see a leucocephala uh, western yellow wagtail, a really smart bird. One of the big advantages of traveling around Mongolia is you have to rely on camping. But it does give you total flexibility of where you stop and where you stay. Uh, and you don't have to ask permission. You just stop the cars and the crew put the tents up. And... Uh, you don't have to worry about neighbours because it's none for another 40 miles. So it's, it's really camping in the wilderness taken to an extreme. And it's a, it's a lovely experience, especially when you wake up in the morning uh, and you, you're greeted by this cacophony of horned larks singing. Um, uh, and that's all you can hear. It really is a fantastic place. Uh, and the stony desert sort of habitat that we're in here with very little vegetation uh, was worth scanning. Uh, hard because there were birds to be found. Uh, horned lark uh, was a very, very common bird. We saw that in lots of uh, different habitats, but particularly these. And of course, the enigmatic Palaces sangre, so always uh, on people's target list to see a really lovely bird. Uh, and we started coming across small groups of those uh, as we headed south. They so became a bit more common in the semi desert habitats. Uh, mammals as well were well represented here. Uh, this is a very poor picture. Uh, it's not mine. <laughs> um, but these are Saiger antelope, uh, a really rare antelope that once was widespread throughout Central Asia uh, and has now really shrunk its range. And I, I don't know whether it's restricted to Mongolia, whether it still occurs in Kazakhstan. Um, I'm not sure. Um, but they were incredibly shy. So we'd be driving along, spot some in half a mile range, and within a minute, they were a mile away. And they could see us from a long way off, and they would run at speed and disappear. So we never got close to them, but we did get some fine telescope views. And uh, goited gazelles were a bit more approachable. Uh, we saw quite a few of these. But as we headed south in that sort of Great Depression area, we would come across more of the isolated freshwater lakes, which, again, magnet for migratory birds. Um, really quite extensive freshwater lakes still, although some in the eastern part of that depression are shrinking in size over the last 20 years. Uh, but nevertheless, we, this was Boonsagan Lake, a uh, famous birding spot. And we arrived there late one evening. Uh, and then, obviously, up the next morning at the crack of dawn, uh, we wanted to find out what was there and what delights we could, we could find. So off we set over the marshes uh, to lots of waders migrating through. Lesser sand plover we had here, which is quite a good bird to get for this area. Uh, but one of the great experiences with the migration of the white-winged black terns, they were literally streaming through. And we had flocks of up to about 3,000 birds together, all in their summer finery, uh, and often flying at eye level 10 or 15 feet away from you as they just move through. So really spectacular to see. Um, and another gull species, I'm not a great larophile, but who doesn't like a palaces gull or great black-headed gull? A really lovely gull, and we saw a number of them at Boonsagen. 
lake. And oh, again, all in their breeding plumages. There's lots of other little lakes that were dotted around, and we did try to venture towards some of these, not always successfully, as you can see. Uh, we did get stuck now and again. But every little freshwater lake was just full of birds. And this particular lake, we could have spent a day there. It was tiny, um, smaller than Clyde Reserve in Norfolk, if you're familiar with that. Um, but that reed bed at the back there was full of paddy pool warblers, palaces, grasshopper warblers, Isabeline shrike. Um, there were pipits everywhere. There was white winged black terns, whiskered terns, marsh tern. We saw our only falcated duck on here. There was lots of other duck. You just could have spent hours watching, watching the birds there. And of course, the white winged black terns were giving you uh, fantastic photographic opportunities. Um, one of my favorite terns really is. Uh, wonderful to see and we enjoyed a good hour or so watching this lake and every now and again there'd be uh, a little uh, sort of homestead just show that people can still eke out a living in these uh, rather arid and, and sparse uh, areas um, but it was the real desert we wanted to get to next and so as we moved south and southwest uh, it became drier and drier sandier and sandier and the vegetation less and less uh, every now and again, we'd come across a small settlement, um, tiny little villages, uh, still had 4G signal in them. How they, that, that worked, I don't know. But every village had a, a little school or restaurant with bushes outside. And the bushes were absolutely full of migrants. There were common rose finches everywhere, Asian brown flycatchers, uh, two barred warblers, two barred greenish warblers, like this one, Asian brown flies, as I say and uh, dark-sided flycatchers. So we could have wasted hours looking at through these bushes. They were full of palaces warblers. Sometimes the palaces warblers were, were round your feet as well. So very approachable, very much in the open as they were grasping insects on their long journey north. Uh, and interspersed with the flatlands was also sort of little hill ranges where there'd be rocky gorges. And within these rocky gorges, you would find other species as well. Um, uh, things like the lesser kestrel uh, breeding there, fine male. Uh, eagle owl, we had roosting, uh, Eurasian eagle owl roosting in, in a rock face there. And pied wheat ears as well were very common in this more rocky habitat. But it was this, this habitat that we were particularly uh, keen to, to get into. Uh, this is the habitat of the Bactrian camel, not wild ones. These are domesticated. We didn't go to the small area in the south of Mongolia where Bactrian camels uh, exist in the wild. Uh, but nevertheless, this was full of birds and typical uh, desert birds as well. So the Asian desert warbler, um, there's uh, quite a few of these singing away and um, quite approachable. Unlike the next species, Henderson's ground jay, which uh, is, is a comical species, lovely, I love ground jays, uh, the way they run across the ground and think they're hiding in the shadow of a bush, but you can see them in full view and then they run off again. Uh, never very approachable, uh, but nevertheless, we enjoyed some fine views of, of Henderson's ground jay. One bird we did get really good views of is we came across uh, a little settlement with a few bushes that had a, a, obviously quite a colony of saxel sparrows and this is a fine male, and we got lots of different views of males and females and, and immature birds as well. So we spent a, a good half an hour or so uh, enjoying the Saxel sparrows, surely one of the, the nicest sparrows. But as we headed south, um, you can see that the temperatures were getting warmer. Uh, that obviously had some recent rain, and suddenly there's a flurry of uh, irises appear in what is, appears like a desert, adding a splash of color to our view. And it certainly was beginning to get nice and warm now, so we could shed a few layers that we'd been uh, wearing from earlier in the trip. But the landscape is, is relentless. And uh, uh, if you're agoraphobic, this isn't the place to go, because it is vast. Uh, I've never seen anywhere quite as vast as this. Uh, and you just seem to go for hours and hours. And uh, how the dry, uh, there's, there's not just one track, there's hundreds of tracks going through this, and how the drivers know where they're going. I think they pick a point in the distant mountains and just head for it. Uh, but eventually, we came south to a bit of a touristy area. And this is the famous, or part of, the famous Congo Els dunes. Uh, these dunes are a very extensive part in the, in the Gobi Desert. 
They're about 120 kilometers long by 30 kilometers wide. Some of those dunes get up to 300 meters in height. And the dunes themselves are pretty burdens. Not much lives in the sand, but the vegetated areas on either side, well, there's quite a few birds to be seen there. Uh, and so we had the luxury of moving out of our tents and staying in a traditional, or so-called traditional, bit touristy, uh, gear camp uh, with the luxury of a bed. And that was uh, most welcome for, for us. Uh, and really a very comfortable and quiet place to stay, uh, despite being touristy. But the next morning, we were out to see what birds we could see. There were, we'd seen most of the desert birds, but it was lovely to see the morning flight of the, the palace's sand grouse. And we had some fine views of these calling overhead and flying by. A really, really one of my favorite birds. And uh, I think a bird that uh, many young British bird watcher would want to see turning up in the UK again. Um, uh, whether that will ever happen, we don't know. There was a bit of an eruption westwards this, this spring, but none came this way. Uh, another, of course, desert species to enjoy are things like the toad-headed agama. I'm not sure which species exactly this is. Uh, uh, James might be able to tell me later, um, but we saw lots of those. And uh, Pallidostris, a uh, race of great grey shrike. Um, this one's probably a first summer bird with its pinkish flush and not quite complete face mask. Um, so we had a, a pair of those, which was nice to see. And of course, the ever-present uh, desert wheat here in this sort of habitat. You see lots of those around and, and great to see. They actually had one singing on top of our, our Gur tent. But it was time to leave the sand dunes and the desert behind and head to a slightly different habitat up into the Gobi Altai range. And this is a place called Yolin An. And I'm led to believe that the words Yolin An actually mean bearded vulture or valley of the bearded vulture. And sure enough, we got to this valley, a beautiful back valley just to walk through. Um, but also uh, it was full of birds and full of bearded vultures. And um, one of the it had a little stream running through it, and the stream was a real magnet for bathing birds and drinking birds in, in what is ultimately a dry, dry area. So we enjoyed nice views of things like Godlewski's bunting, a bird I hadn't seen for over 20 years. Nice to see those in their breathing finery, uh, and also familiar birds, European birds, like this uh, Eurasian crag martin. And it was just full of migrants, um, mainly Veloscopus warblers, uh, such as this greenish warbler. Uh, all in the open, all hopping around on the ground and on lumps of them and bathing in the stream. And palaces warblers again, just bathing in the stream and then preening on little rocks. Uh, so unlike how we see them in Western Europe in the autumn. And uh, white-winged snowfinch, a common bird uh, at this altitude. We're about 2,000 meters, I guess, here. Um, so lower than you would expect to see them in, say, the uh, Alpine region of Europe. But uh, they're very common, obviously used to the tourists. It's like tourist spot, this, uh, because they were feeding around our feet in, in the car park. But one of the key birds that people go to Yolinan to find, uh, and not difficult to see, is the uh, Kozlos Accenter. Uh, possibly not the most exciting of the Accenters, uh, but nevertheless, a really nice bird to see. Uh, uh, and one for the Accenter list, definitely. And mammals as well, uh, well represented in these mountain ranges. Uh, this is a si young Siberian ibex. Um, we didn't see any full males with their full horns, uh, but we enjoyed some views of these uh, uh, navigating these sheer rocky cliffs, and uh, you really could appreciate how four hoofs are better than two feet. And this area is also uh, known for other mammals. Um, Palaces count, we didn't see that. that that's in this area, uh, as well as snow leopard. But having all looked for snow leopard in Ladakh and seen it out there, I knew how hard it was, and our chances of seeing a snow leopard uh, were going to be very, very slim indeed. Uh, we did scan, but there was certainly no joy in there. But that night, everything changed. We were sworn to secrecy made to drink each other's blood, and told never to tell anyone about this. And we drove before dawn, a couple of hours over the stony desert, blindfolded, met up with the guy with this Russian four-wheel drive, and words were exchanged, probably money, and we all piled in. And then we headed off into the mountains, up a dry river valley, Parked the vehicle behind a rock, told to get out quietly, 
And there you can see Tuman saying to Martin, just look in that cave up there, because that's what greeted us. Uh, we had about five hours watching these two sibling snow leopards who had been frequenting this uh, cave, and we were lucky enough to have the tip off about this. Uh, and thanks to Tuman, our ground agent. Uh, and these animals just looked at us and looked at us. We were that close. So uh, it, it was a wonderful few hours spent in the mountains, and we were all pretty speechless out after seeing, having that uh, encounter. But there were still birds to be seen, and so we headed out of the mountains and back down to this very flat, very sparsely vegetated, stony plain. Because this had one particular bird we were yet to see, uh, and was the key bird for one of our Danish participants who would have gone the whole trip without seeing any other bird. He wanted to see this. And of course, this stony environment has lots of palaces sandgrass, as you would expect, uh, but the one bird he wanted to see was this, uh, the oriental plover, uh, surely one of the, the world's smartest plovers. Uh, I'd been lucky enough to see this species in Cambodia many, many years ago uh, in breeding plumage, but there was something special about driving carefully over this plain, all spread out about half a mile, and then suddenly looking out my window and think, there's one here, and it just was 20 yards away from the vehicle. So we enjoyed that for a good half an hour or so as it just ran around us. Uh, giving everyone fantastic views uh, and really was one of the highlights of the trip. Uh, it certainly was for Henrik. I'm sure he went off and had a little cry afterwards uh, and who would blame him? But it was time to head back north and we found another tarmac road, uh, a main road, the highway back to Ulaanbaatar, which was brilliant to see. And um, of course, with the tarmac road come all the service stations that you can stop off. Nothing like a good open air urinal. I'm not quite sure what the ladies would have done, um, but the facilities were certainly fine for us. Uh, and we had one final stop on our route back to Ulaanbaatar. We stayed at a place called Baga Gazaren Gulu, Kulu, uh, where, which is a, a rocky outcrop, and I think it's a national park, or it's an area designated for protection. And here we stayed in a, a traditional gear camp, one that was really felt real and authentic. We stayed on a little homestead with the owners of these the gears uh, around their farm uh, and it really was a lovely experience because it's such a peaceful site and this site's particularly good for, for mammals um, it was our only site that we saw a garlic sheep um, a, a really smart horned sheep we saw quite a few of these and palaces pika as well uh, which was really really nice lovely little animals pikas um, to see and uh, a few birds as well, uh, rock sparrows um, were very common around the farm. They were breeding in the, in the walls surrounding the cattle pens, um, so we saw lots of those. Uh, and one bird that we actually saw a lot of, and I hadn't mentioned before, is the monk vulture, uh, probably the commonest raptor we saw on the trip. They were pretty widespread uh, and always lovely to see, even if they're in a tatty, heavy mold, as in this one. But it was time to get back to the capital. Um, back to Ulaanbaatar, and it felt very different arriving back two weeks later, or just over two weeks later, into a really uh, much greener greener place. And uh, Ulaanbaatar is, is quite a pleasant city, despite its reputation for smog and Soviet-style building. Uh, it's still got some nice little rivers running through with nice bushes, which can attract migrants in falls. We, we had too fine a weather, so we didn't really see any migrants here, but we did see some of the specialities of this area, uh, things like white crown penduline tit, uh, a really, really smart little penduline tit, and of course the tit that everyone really likes uh, is the azure tit, and they were quite common there as well, uh, one of my favorite birds as well. And so we headed out of Ulaanbaatar and back up into the uh, tiger belt, the boreal forest, where it felt very, very spring-like compared to our visit to the Kapakali site in the far west. It was much greener, there were a lot more birds singing, uh, and so we had an enjoyable 24, 48 hours in this area. Um, the larch trees were becoming, coming into leaf now, and, and flowers were out. I, I'm not a botanist, so I can't tell you what all these are, but they were certainly lovely flowers. Uh, I know this one's a, a primula, uh, farinosa, um, because it's Martin's photograph and he sent it to me, but also butterflies on the wing as well. We had Fenton's wood white, 
uh, amongst, amongst the, the plethora of butterflies that were now flying around, and scarce heath was nice, and a few mammals. Red squirrels were very common, Siberian chipmunk as well. Um, it was nice to see. And of course, the ever-present uh, pine bunting. We were back in pine bunting land, and they were singing their hearts out, along with black-faced buntings. Uh, and a bird which was, uh, I wanted to see in its breeding habitat was this dusky warbler. Dusky warblers sing from the top of birch trees, so unlike how I'm used to seeing them as a, as a rare, rarity in the UK in the autumn. Uh, and quite an interesting song, nothing like any of the philoscopuses that we, we get in Western Europe. Uh, and another bird that's noted for its skulky behaviour, but here was singing its heart out, uh, was Siberian ruby throats. Uh, um, a lovely bird that, that with a beautiful song, not quite as like nightingale, but you know similar quality. But one bird I particularly wanted to see, because I've seen them in the UK in autumn, scrubbling around the grass, but here in their breeding habitat was the lovely lanceolated warbler. And it was a real treat to, to see these birds uh, in their breeding habitat and reeling away with their high-pitched reel, not dissimilar to our own grasshopper warbler, slightly higher pitched. And that for me, it was a great way to, to end the trip uh, in, in the hills there. So it's time to uh, say goodbye to Mongolia uh, and head back to the capital, not without doing the touristy bit of visiting the famous Genghis Khan uh, monument, um, a really uh, fantastic place to go, actually. This, this monument is huge, absolutely huge, and we saw it in lovely fine weather, uh, and a fitting end to uh, our excursion and adventures around Mongolia. Uh, I think at this point I should also thank uh, not only Bertoratia and Martin for expertly getting us around the country, but also our ground agents and driving crew, all who were, as you would expect, great fun to be with and made the trip really worthwhile. Uh, and perhaps I should just finish on um, the highlight of the trip, really. Not an avian um, venture at all, but just... Uh, our encounter with Snow Leopard. Thank you very much. actually climbed up after we'd watched the finale so we, in the guide of our tomb and we climbed up onto a ridge to actually look down on the cave here. So the only which impressed me most, the view of this for an 86-year-old American Vietnam vet who climbed up this cliff using just one stick. I was in awe of his keenness to get better views of these. Yeah, I see the chuka. We spent about three to four hours. Did you see the chuka? I, I didn't see it. We never ventured out in the cave. White stop spots. They have to push this, this wall here. It's the skin. They got bored with us by now. We were quite alert when we first arrived. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. What a finale that was. Um, and truly some great photos and mouth-watering trip. Um, so I'm going to introduce an uh, old friend of mine, uh, James Eaton. Uh, James is a pioneering birder and biologist. Uh, he's been living in the Oriental region for over 20 years. 
primarily in Malaysia, more recently in Thailand. And together with his business partner, Rob Hutchinson, many of you may also know, James is the co-founder of Bird Tour Asia, an eco-tour company which, from its inception, set new standards of species finding success, I speak with experience, from experience, and customer service for that industry. James's countless thousands of hours spent in the field made him the ideal man to co-author Birds of the Indonesian Archipelago a couple of years ago, covering the Greater Sundas and Wallacea in a depth never previously achieved and recognizing a significant number of new species along the way. James has long held an interest in promoting birding tourism with community involvement, also interest in cryptic diversity and exploration birding, which is James's own phrase. And as a result, I can think of no one better qualified to talk to us today on the subject of successes and failures, the quest to find new and lost birds. James, over to you. Thanks, Chris. I'll try and live up to that. Afternoon, everybody. So I am going to talk to you about my personal quest to find new species um, and rediscover lost species throughout Asia, really. There's a lot of failures amongst the successes, and I will try and give you a broad sweep between the two. Over the last 40 years, there's been a lot of discoveries in Asia. Um, you will see from this little map, um, over the last 40 years, there's been a lot of species found primarily in the last 20 years, particularly at the turn of the decade. If you look at the little map, you'll see little hotspots of uh, discoveries, um, particularly, particularly in Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. That's because of the opening up of the forests, new roads, um, the majority of which found by one person, Jonathan Eames. Um, and then also opening up of northeast India and Achal Pradesh. There was the Bougainvillea cichla that was found. And, and then if you look in, in the Philippines as well, there was quite a few discoveries, all of which in the last 20 years, again, very few birds got found in the 80s and the 90s. Um, why is that? Why such a, an interest in the last 20 years to find stuff? It's largely because Asia was pretty late in the ornithological world for recent discoveries. Um, in the last 20 years, there's been lots of, lots of people being, going into the fields, new roads opening up, deforestation, meaning you can get into new areas. Previously, you couldn't. Um, and many of the species found are all in the same genus. There's a lot of philoscopus, uh, a lot of mysomelas, laughing thrushes, babblers, baubles, but very few owls. In fact, I think probably all the owls are probably described by Pam, at least, I don't know, four or five, <laughs> um, including that one in the middle, Sangir Scops owl, which we'll get a little bit to later. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about how do you find a new bird. This took me a very long time to work out. Um, go where no birder has gone before. That was my initial philosophy coming into Asia. I started birding in Asia in about uh, the turn of the century, and we would go to the most remote areas, <clears throat> searching for known species. Um, we go camping along old logging roads, discuss with local hunters what's here, what can we find. We'd stay in squalid conditions, putting our bodies through hell, having to, as you'll see in the, the top right, this fine specimen on the left um, is Rob Hutchinson holding um, a bottle of water. And we're actually filtering the river water in a logging camp um, by using a handkerchief. That handkerchief was also used to clean the binoculars. Um, on that trip, we didn't find any new species. Um, and we, I did this for 10, 15 years. Um, and we found lots of great birds, photographed birds that have never been photographed before. But we never actually found anything new. Um, 
And at the time, I was just happy birding, birding along. But at the same time, I really wanted to find a new bird um, because I always think the pinnacle of, the, of your kind of birding career must be to see something that nobody else has seen before. Um, for example, if you're out twitching, it's great seeing a, a bird, but, you know, everybody else has already seen it. It's not new. The, the feeling of discovering a bird when you're out birding is it's a real kick, and that's, that's the kind of feelings that you really want. So I really wanted to try and get that feeling of what it's like to find a new bird. Um, so number one, I completely failed with. Um, and I went to number two, uh, rummaging through specimens in a museum drawer. So early explorers, they made a real effort to find as many new species as possible. And in fact, it's amazing when you go through a museum drawer, how many um, birds have been described from early explorers and how few new birds get found now. It just shows how meticulous um, these explorers were 100 years ago. Um, I spent, I don't know, a few days every, every year for the last 15 years visiting um, museums and going through the drawers, looking at um, specimens because I have a real interest in, in taxonomy, um, in um, identification issues, and it's a great way to really see a bird close up, turn it upside down, and see it measuring, seeing them side by side, seeing how you can identify a bird close up, get that level of detail. Um, as Chris mentioned, I, I co-authored the field guide, Birds of Indonesia, and a large part of that work was spent in museums. And I was thought, okay, great. Not many people have looked at these specimens in recent times. I will be able to find something new. And despite all this effort, I didn't find anything. And I start to realize it's, it's later on I realize it's because I don't have that level of expertise looking at specimens to see something that others, um, others don't. And that's where people like, and Pam's discovered many new species of owl in just in the in the drawers, right? You open up and you see something new, and and you describe it, and it's amazing. And then birders will go into the field and maybe find that new species, discover its vocalizations, and see how different it really is. Um, one example that I do have is is these um, three specimens. One on the oh, on the very left. They're all Sunder frog mouths. Um, it's classified as monotypic in all checklists. Um, it's a bird that's found in Sumatra and Java. But when I've seen these in the field, they sound very different between the two islands. So I've long suspected that there would be two species involved. And when you look at the specimens, you will see the one on the left, which is from Borneo, is really blackish. It's a blackish gray with white markings. You can't really see the color so well on here, but mainly on the, on the right side, you'll see how this one has a very brownish breast compared to the blackish breast. This bird has no brownish tones whatsoever. You can see it in the tail as well. So the birds on the right, and the rightmost bird is from Sumatra. Great. So they look different and they sound different. So you'd think, great. I'm going to be able to describe these. But then you have an issue. This bird in the center is from southern Borneo. It's from South Kalimantan. And it's not labeled as anything significant. However, you'll probably take note that it has a brownish breast as well. So what do you do about that? I haven't done anything about it because I genuinely don't know what to do. <laughs> Somebody needs to go into the field, into southern Kalimantan, and try and find this bird. And maybe it will sound different to the bird on the left and the bird on the right. And if it does, then you have an undescribed 
new species. So if anybody fancies finding a new bird, I'm giving you a bit of a clue here um, before I get there. So when I realized I pretty much failed with that, apart from that bird, um, the third way of looking for a new bird um, would be something that is only really possible in recent years. And it was touched upon in the first talk by, by Pam earlier on. Um, vocally distinct species. So here you'll see um, two birds that look, well, the lighting's a bit different, but they are identical. I've seen the specimens, you turn them upside down, inside out, back to front, and they look absolutely identical. Um, it's a monotypic species. By monotypic, it means there is only one, one subspecies. There's no subspecies, it's just the bird. Um, however, one day I went, so where this bird occurs is a little I, two little islands in eastern Indonesia that you can see here. This is the Tanimbars, and this is Babar. Um, the Tanimbars are a little series of islands that are very well explored. Um, the last new species was described there in 1987, um, a bush warbler. But otherwise, it's very well known uh, avian diversity, avian species there. But Babar, the island to the left, is very little visited. There's been two or three birders um, that have been there between the, turn, between the turn of the century and the previous 100 years. I organized a boat to go to, the, to some small islands, and we included going to Babar. And this was the first time that I actually came to, to, in contact with this bird. And everybody knows fantails, they're very common birds. They're found everywhere, um, in open, open landscapes, in the town, everywhere you walk, you hear their lovely little twinkle call. Oh, great, cinnamon felled fan fantail. Didn't think anything of it. It's got this lo lovely little twinkled call. It's very standard little call. And then I went to the tannin bars, and sure enough, there was cinnamon tailed fantail. Huh, it's a very different call. And then I thought, huh, it's a different call. But because I had only visited the islands briefly, you never know if a bird sounds different on the two islands or if, it's, if there's overlap, just an individual variation. You're never quite sure. So it would mean you'd have to go back to Babar and reconfirm that it is different, which I ended up doing. And yeah, sure enough. As you'll see on the, so there's a sonogram here. You'll see the birds from Babar, the call goes up and down. Whereas the birds in the Tannenbar is this ascending song. And it's, it's consistent on both islands. And you do a playback experiment. You'll play the call. What I always recommend doing first is, is playing the call from the other island first, because then if you play, say, the Babar recording to the Babar birds, you get them really excited straight away. And then the moment you play a call from the tannin bars, because it's still vaguely similar, it will still be excited and you'll probably elicit a strong response. So it's not really a good playback experiment. So you're not really getting a good idea of how different they truly are. So I went back to the Babar and I played the tannin bar song and sure enough, there was no response. And then I played the Babar song to the Babar birds, and they went crazy. Likewise, I went back to the Tannin Bars, played the Babar song, the Tannin Bar birds weren't bothered, played the Tannin Bar song, and the birds went crazy. So there you think, surely we have a new species, an undescribed species, which would be the Babar birds. Um, this bird was described from the Tannin Bars, which would mean it would be quite easy, you would think, to, to get the uh, species uh, scientifically described. 
is Babar Whistler, uh, Babar Fantel. However, these cryptically different, these cryptically plumaged uh, birds that sound different are very difficult to actually get described because how do you convince people that they are vocally different? You would need a massive um, sample size, really, because you need to prove that these birds do not overlap at all. Maybe you need 20, 20 uh, sound recordings of each taxa, maybe 30, maybe 40. How do you know for sure that that bird does not utter the song from the other island? It's, it's something that is very difficult to prove, and that goes to show in, in recent literature. I mean, there's very few birds that have been described purely on the basis of their song. Um, I can't think of, of any in Asia that are different plumage-wise, just the song. There's a cuckoo in Africa that's been described on the basis of a different song. And that fantail got me thinking, how many more of these birds must there be in Asia that would have a very different song? Um, but actually, plumage-wise, they're just the same. I lived in Malaysia for 18 years. And this bird, uh, dark hawk cuckoo, um, was on my local patch, still is. And I would hear these birds every time I went up there. Um, it occurs in all the mountains of Malaysia, the mountains of Sumatra, and the mountains of Borneo. It's a common bird. Any of you that have been to Sumatra, Malaysia, Borneo, you've probably all seen this bird. Um, I would hear it all the time. Um, it's brain fever song. As you'll see this long series um, that, with a climatic ending, it, uh, it's a brilliant song to hear in the early morning. And I would always hear it, and I would hear it doing its normal, normal song as well, which is, is a fairly flat song. But because I live in the region, and I would go to Sumatra annually, I would go to Borneo two or three times annually, I would hear these songs all the time. Every time I go out, oh, dark hawk cuckoo. Um, sometimes they're excited, sometimes they're not. And I was in Aceh, in northern Sumatra, in 2014. And I was birding with um, a good friend of mine, uh, Frank Wright. And he really wanted to see dark hawk cuckoo. So I got my sound recording. I played a recording of it, and it didn't come in. I said, don't worry about it. I've got its excited song that it will always come into. And sure enough, I played this excited song, and in came the bird, and it is this individual. And he said to me, do you know what? I think these birds only do that excited call. Only this call. They don't do this song. I've only heard that in Borneo. And sure enough, we went on to, it's a good uh, plug for citizen science, we went on to Zeno Canto and looked at all the sound recordings and the sound recordings that I had. And sure enough, it turns out that the birds from Sumatra and, Mal and Peninsula Malaysia only do this song. And the birds on Borneo only do that. So they have another cryptically plumaged bird that sounds absolutely completely different. Um, I can even play you a little bit of the song here. So this is the, the birds from Sumatra and Malaysia. And if you listen to it carefully, it's a two note call as it calls on. slowly rising and I just always assumed that, that was just an excited call so this bird was hiding in plain sight for 18 years of my life and this is the bird from Borneo as you'll hear it's a free note flat song so I came to realize that actually I thought I was 
very keen on the minute details of, of birds. But I obviously wasn't. I had completely ignored this bird that was on my local patch for 18 years, and it was completely different to the birds that I was seeing in other times of the year. And it made me realize that I really needed to improve. Um, and these birds are still, this bird is still undescribed, um, which is frustrating. There are specimens, we've looked at them, turned them upside down again, inside out, pulled them apart. We can't find a single difference. On here you'll see, oh, great, it's got a more reddish uh, on the breast extending down to this bird. But it, the problem is, is there's individual variation and the birds from Borneo also have that extensive red breast sometimes. So again, I was failing on that one. And finally, a nice one is little cuckoo dove, which any of you that have birded anywhere in Southeast Asia will have seen this bird. It's all over Thailand, it's all over Northern Vietnam, Myanmar, Malaysia, Sumatra, nearly all of Indonesia, the Lesser Sunda Islands, all of the Greater Sundas. The Dawn Chorus, this, is, this bird you hear all the time, with its long notes, up to 50 notes, going all, all morning long. Um, yeah, I hear it on my local patch, I hear it everywhere I go birding. And then one day, I was on um, the island of Timor, which is this island just here, the easternmost island of its range. And I heard a single note, um, just a woo, which is, sounds like any old pigeon. Anywhere we go in Asia, all we hear are these woos and these oos and coos of pigeons. And we largely ignore them because they all sound pretty much the same. But on Timor, there's not many species um, of pigeon. I was a little bit confused because I know these coos and these woos, but I didn't know that one. Um, so later on in the day, I came across a little cuckoo dove and it got me thinking. I wonder if it's just a, an obscure, I don't know, a, a, an alarm call, a contact call of this cuckoo dove and not the regular song. So anyway, I went back to my daily life and carried on birding. And then the following year, I was on this island to the west, Sumba. And again, I heard the same woo. And I took a sound recording and I played it back and in came this bird. And that's when the penny dropped that, huh, this is little cuckoo dove and it sounds just the same as it did on Timor, on these two islands, but completely different to the rest. It made me realize that I, know, I don't hear this long 50 note call on these two islands. So what do we have here? Um, I looked in all the old literature and found that the birds had been collected on Timor and Sumba. And they were part of the same race that occurs on the other Lesser Sunda Islands, Orientalis. Um, little cuckoo dove is made up of several subspecies. Um, the Orientalis race, which looks pretty similar to all the rest, a bit more rusty on the wing, not quite as uh, well marked on the breast. But unfortunately, when I looked at the specimens from Timor and Sumba, they look absolutely identical to the birds on Flores, Sumbawa and Lombok. They have this 50 note call. So again, I was stuck with this one. And to this day, it's still undescribed. And we've looked at specimens. And because we can't see a, an, an obvious difference in the plumage, getting to identify and describe that bird is something that is beyond my capabilities. Um, hopefully somebody will do it one day, but at the moment it remains a little cuckoo dove and irrelevance to most people. So then the fourth way I thought of trying to find a new bird. Um, and I think it's a way that probably a lot of people um, discover new birds. I don't know if anybody here has found a new bird in the fields, but it's 
it's a really hard thing to do. Um, over the course of a year, maybe one or two birds get found that are completely new to science. Um, and it's usually in somewhere like Amazonia, where some researchers will, will find an ant bird on one side of the river, and the ant bird on the other side of the river is unknown, put up a net, and they'll catch an ant bird, and it will look, look, look different, sound a little different, and it'll get described. Um, in Asia, it's a really difficult thing to say, as I mentioned before. The early explorers did such a, an amazing job of collecting everything in Asia that there's pretty much nothing left for the rest of us. So I thought I'd try and get lucky. And again, on the island of Timor, here we are. It's an island that several of you have probably visited. Um, it's a fairly nondescript island. It has maybe 20 endemics, a few more shared with the surrounding islands. And um, I was taking a group of birders to see all the endemics. And we went to the beautiful mountain of Mount Mutis. Again, some of you might have visited. It's a highly modified landscape. Um, there is cattle that have made sure that all the undergrowth has completely disappeared. Uh, there was a Locustella that was um, collected here in 1936, a lot of them, and it's not been seen since. Um, not surprising, given the state of the undergrowth there. So you don't really expect to find too much in the undergrowth. But there's one bird that you do look for here, um, going along the beautiful trail. And there was one bird that, that we still hadn't seen which is this. It's a tricolored parrot finch. Every time you read any literature about this bird, the first word you'll probably come across would be unmistakable. You open the field guide, tricolored parrot finch, unmistakable. And sure, there it is, blue, green, red. This one's busy eating a bright yellow mango. Um, and yeah, unmistakable. So that's what we were doing. We were going to look for the unmistakable tricolored parrot finch on this trail. And the very furtive things, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with parrot finches, do a very high pitched call, um, furt furtively in the undergrowth, very difficult to find, difficult to get other people onto the bird. Um, and sure enough, in the evening, we managed to find the unmistakable tricolored parrot finch. That one. Um, but it's still unmistakable. It's bright green, kind of. And we were really happy because, there we go, tricolor pirate finch, the last endemic of the trip. But I was, I was a little bit confused because this was in 2008 and it had buffish underparts. It's fine, it's a juvenile. Um, juveniles often get seen here. Um, okay, whatever, people are happy because it's, it's, at the end of the day, it's a tick. And that's why you go to these islands. You want to see the endemics. But more often than not, it's about seeing every single endemic and getting that tick. Um, but I was a little bit confused because when I was watching this bird, I noticed on the ear coverts in the telescope, they were slightly bluish. I thought, that's OK. Um, it's an immature. And tricolor parrot finches, at the end of the day, they have a blue ear covert. I mean, the rest of the body is blue, but they have blue ear coverts. So that makes perfect sense. But I was a little confused that you have blue on the ear coverts, but then it had a green breast and buffish underparts. And the, the green breast didn't make much sense to me because if it's all buff as a juvenile should be, that would just turn into blue. But the green adult-like feathers on the breast didn't really fit. And I was a little bit confused, but the only, there's a, a blue-eared parrot finch that's on surrounding islands that also has blue ear and a green breast. And I always thought to myself, okay, maybe blue-eared parrot finch, uh, blue-faced parrot finch, is possible on Timor. Um, but I wanted to keep those feelings to myself, and I did. Because at the end of the day, 
I didn't want the birders that I was taking around to feel disappointed because if I'd put, if I'd put a seed of doubt in their mind that they hadn't seen tricolored parrotfinch, then it's one tick fewer for them. And I'm trying to sell a tour. That's, it's not good business. So we kept it as it was. It's a tricolored parrotfinch. Everybody's happy. Um, roll forward four years later. And once again, we're looking for the unmistakable tricolored parrotfinch. And exactly the same area, within 50 meters. And I needed to take a break for a minute. So I excused myself to go into the bushes. And as I was there, I suddenly heard a parrot finch. And, oh, okay, try call a parrot finch. At that moment in time, there was nothing I could do. I wasn't in a position to call the group over. I thought, it's okay, we'll see them at some point. But I didn't actually have a really good photo of tri parrot finches at that, that point. So I thought, okay, great, I'm going to, I've got 30 seconds, so I'm going to have my camera available just in case. So there I was, ready for the unmistakable tri parrot finch to come into view. And then this happened. And... It's, it's a very surreal moment that is kind of undescribable, but your kind of legs shake, your arms go turn into jelly, and you realise at that very precise moment that it's something completely new to science. It's a, an undescribed bird. And there I was taking pretty good photos at the time of this bird. And I got this one photo, that was it. One photo, it was in the time of DSLR, which was obviously really noisy at the time. It heard my camera click and shot off. Surreal moment, because I then had to go back to tell a group that <laughs> my little break had a little bit of an unexpected moment. And when I showed them the back of my camera, they were obviously very confused about what I was about to show them. So when I showed them this, they were even more confused. And I had to explain to them that actually this bird is a completely unknown species and we're now forgetting about tricolor parrot finches and we're going to look for this. Um, so this, to this day, this bird is still undescribed. And it's quite amazing to think this bird could still be undescribed because like I say, it's in an area that was, that was visited by the early explorers in, in the 1930s, well collected. They collected undergrowth birds that, to this day, haven't been seen here again since. Um, and why that is, we're not really sure, because now that we, we go back to this island, this mountain every year, and you can see 10, 20 birds, and they're not too difficult to see. So why were they not caught 100 years ago? We still don't know. Um, a friend of mine actually tried to misnet this bird a few years ago to describe it. And um, he spent two weeks there and didn't find a single one. But that might be because of time of year, which might mean that they move away during a period of time. And that was probably when the collectors went there when they were actually absent from the mountain. So that was really exciting. And I realized that the best way to find a new bird is just to get lucky and to choose your pee stops wisely. So as exciting as it is to find a new bird, what, when I first came to Asia, what really got me going was flicking through the field guides and, and seeing birds that you read the text and it says, unknown, not seen since collection. This bird, the black brow babbler, which any of you that have been paying attention into the birding press for the last three years will know all about. Um, it was known, this is, I always remember in the Birds of the Great Asunders, McKinnon and Phillips field guide, and there's an illustration of this bird in the bottom right corner of the field guide. And it's known from this one specimen, 
with this bright yellow eye. And it was collected. It wasn't even known what year it was collected. Carl Schwaner wandered around Kalimantan for five years, collecting a few birds. And then he sent them to Java. Um, Charles Bonaparte saw the specimen, assumed it was from Java, described it from Java. Um, and then roll forward, as you'll see, 45 years later, Burkhofer, Burkhofer's babbler's fame, noticed the error because Schwana had only visited Kalimantan and knew that he'd spent a lot of time in Ban Banjo Masin, which is off in the south here. However, Banjo Masin is a major trading hub. So a lot of the time when specimens are labelled ba Banjo Masin, it's actually because it was a trading port rather than collected from there. Um, and then what really ignited my imagination is nine years ago now, there was a, an, a paper written by Nigel Collar who looked at this one specimen. And I always remember the last sentence, who in recent years or indeed living memory has spent any time systematically bird watching in wooded habitats remain in southern South Kalimantan. It is time someone did. That stuck with me because I realised that somebody really should. And as this is a bird that I remember from starting off birding in Southeast Asia, I wanted to discover, rediscover this bird. So I looked at a map. One, one thing about birding, what I've said to a lot of people is, if you really want to find good birds, bird watching is the easy part. Um, the hard part is the planning. I say I probably spend 80% of my birding time planning where I'm going to go. And once you get to that place, the birding is actually quite straightforward. You just have to get there. And one of my favourite ways of birding, I'm a geek, I know, is to spend an evening scouring Google Earth. There is nothing more pleasurable in life, opening up Google Earth and looking for recent areas of deforestation, logging roads, tracks, um, any way to get you to places other people haven't been. Um, what I really love about birding is going places that others haven't, um, just because you don't know what you're going to see. And I find it really enjoyable. So that's what I really try and do. So here I was looking, but where should I go? So here's Banjo Masin. That's where the bird was possibly from. This is lowlands. There's no way this bird was going to be in the lowlands. No way. Southern Kalimantan, the lowlands, well explored. And there's this great big mountain range, the Maratus Mountains. To me, it was obvious. It is going to be on this mountain. And Gunung Besar um, translates as biggest mountain. So the biggest mountain in an area that had, was unexplored, close to Banjo Masin, to me, it was pretty obvious that, was, that that's where this bird was going to be. So myself and three friends, we decided we were going to go there. And it turns out that Gunung Besar is a really easy place to visit. Um, Indonesian trekkers go there all the time. So it was easy to organise. You fly into Banjo Masin, hour flight from Jakarta, three hour drive to the base of the mountain, and you walk up. Really simple. And yet, no birder had visited these mountains at all, apart from one person in the 90s that spent a few days there and discovered, found a few birds, but nothing of real interest or things that he had overlooked. Um, so it was a really obvious thing to do. And Nigel was right. Why, why hasn't anybody been there? It's about time somebody went there. So we went there knowing full well that we were going to find black brow babbler. So there we go. Our first morning in the, in the rainforest, in the cloud forest. It's absolutely beautiful. Birds are singing everywhere. We've just hit the forest edge. We're listening out for any little sound, noise. 
it's, it's really difficult to listen and look for something that you don't know what it sounds like. Um, so you have to have a really good understanding of the sights and sounds in the forest. So you know what you're going to listen out for that's different. Otherwise, you're going to spend all day listening and looking for birds that are just common up there. So we found a feeding flock. And the very first feeding flock we came across held a, was a massive party of these. And it turned out that literally the first bird we saw in the forest was a completely undescribed species, never been seen before. Um, this is the Maratus white eye. All the other white eyes in the forest on Borneo have a gray belly. So as soon as we saw this flock of white eyes above us, all yellow underparts, we instantly knew that we had found a new species. So it was pretty exciting. And my friend Frank looked up and said, white eye, the yellow belly, it has to be an unde undescribed species. I still remember <clears throat> uttering those words on the first feeding flock. And within 30 seconds of, of watching these for the first time, this is, this is the first view I had of the bird. In pop this, a nondescript female Sionis flycatcher. Um, Borneo has six or seven species of Sionis flycatcher. Um, it's a family that's particularly close to my heart. And as soon as that popped into view, I said, it's an undescribed species as well. Because, because on Borneo, no female Sionis has a narrow eye ring bar Dayak flycatcher. But the Dayak blue flycatcher has an orange, completely orange belly and orange to under tail coverts. So we instantly knew that there we were in our first feeding flock watching two completely new birds. It was a pretty exciting moment. So the anticipation of finding black bow babbler was, it was fever pitch. Um, as it happened over the next four days, we completely failed to find black brow babbler. So although we did find some good birds, the white eye, here's the male flycatcher, and we also found these two birds. Uh, this was a, a chestnut-hooded laughing thrush, which those who have been to Borneo will know, the, will know the bird well. However, the birds on the Maratus had completely peachy underparts instead of dark grey. And this flecking here and this grey crown here, which the birds elsewhere on Borneo don't have, so that indeed is probably also an undescribed species. And this, which is a Pinan bulbul, um, which is really exciting because Pinan bulbul elsewhere in Borneo have a brown head and brown under underparts. Um, for us, this would also be a good species, but shortly after our visit, um, some researchers went to these mountains um, on the back of our discoveries and described this bird as a subspecies of Penan bulbul, which, okay, um, but described these two as good species. Um, and we'll wait and see what happens to this one. This one remains undescribed to this day. So why didn't we see black brow babbler? Because I knew it was going to be on these mountains. We visited these mountains in 2016, and I got a text message, or I got a, a WhatsApp message in October 2020 asking me what this bird is. Huh, it's a black brow babbler. Pretty momentous moment. Um, hasn't been seen 170 years, and I've got a photo of a live bird in my WhatsApp messages. Um, it was by a bird poacher who didn't recognize the birds and was curious what it was and put it on a um, group chat and the word spread and eventually it, it reached me and it was during a COVID lockdown. So it was a pretty depressing time. And I asked, where was that bird found? And I found out that actually 
my, my dark, lonely evenings spent on Google Earth, I had completely missed something. Because here we are, Gunung Besar, the tall mountain where I, we found all of our birds. But on the right here, you'll see a completely different terrain. And that's limestone karst. And limestone karst how, how, harbors such an amazing endemism of species. Any limestone karst that you go to, there will always be a different gecko, a different frog, a different bat. Um, and in mainland Southeast Asia, there'll be a different limestone babbler, um, nongang babbler, sooty babbler. There is always a different babbler in every limestone cast block. So of course, this bird ended up being a limestone cast specialist. So as wonderful as it was finding all those new birds, I was obviously pretty frustrated about this bird. So it was a real success and failure moment. So then I thought, okay, after that, I'll try again. And um, this time, I decided to go back to Indonesia. I always know if I want to find something interesting, to go to Indonesia. Because it has over 600 endemics. It has 17,000 islands. Birders probably visit 15 of them regularly. And there's a whole suit of others that are there just waiting to be visited. So I decided there was one bird that I really wanted to see. And golden whistlers, um, 56 subspecies, I think it is. And they all look like these birds. Yellow below, black breast band, white throat, black heads. They occur all the way from Indonesia through Australia. Um, and they're all variations on roughly the same theme. However, there is one peculiar bird, the Salaya whistler. It's now split by um, bird life, the bird life taxonomy. I'm sure the other checklist will follow suit. And this bird was collected in the 1930s. Um, and since then, only one of a birder had been to see that bird. It's just found on this little island below Sulawesi. Um, the island of Sulawesi is quite amazing. It's made up of these four arms, all of which in historical times were, all, were separated. These four arms have come together to form a single island, which is why the island is <coughs> home to over 100 endemics. It's an amazing place, full of endemism. And I thought, OK, I'm going to go to this island where this peculiar golden whistler is because if it harbours a bird as distinct as that, maybe there's something else there. There must be something else there. Um, and if I don't find anything new, at least I will see this bird. It'd be nice to get photos, get some sound recordings, find out how distinct it really is. And one of the ways that I thought about trying to find a new species on islands is you have to know a little bit about um, island history, sea levels, all stuff for the layman like me is, is pretty hard to understand. But roughly, you'll see this is the northern tip of Salaya and the southern tip of Sulawesi. One way that you know that islands will probably have endemics is sea level between the islands, those connect, the connecting seas. If the sea level is below 120 meters at its shallowest point, those islands will not have met in recent history for millions of years. They've been disconnected for millions of years. So you know there's a good chance of endemics evolving. And the island of Salaya, at the shallowest point, is 200, 280 meters. 
So you know that that place has a good chance of endemics. And scouring Google Earth once again on another dark, lonely evening, I found that the ridge went up to 620 meters. That's quite high. Surely, as well as the Whistler, there must be something else lurking there. And discussing with my friend Frank, and we were saying, there must be a leaf warbler there. That kind of island must be a leaf warbler. The islands to the south and the islands to the north have leaf warblers. So let's go there, I'll go there, and I'm gonna try and find myself a leaf warbler. So the highest point is here, and you can see roads that go up. But the one thing you're never quite sure on with Google Earth is what the habitat is gonna be like when you get there. Not only is the habitat difficult to discern depending on the satellite quality, but also it might be taken, the satellite imagery might be from a few years ago. So this satellite imagery was taken three, four years before my visit, 2018. And this road that goes over the ridge at 584 meters, I got there and met by this scene. And like a lot of small islands in eastern Indonesia, all the forest has been clear felt and being replaced by cashew nuts. So I got there and I was pretty deflated. Um, no trees, just cashew nuts, no birds. Um, so what else am I gonna do? Well, that island has one other endemic. It has an endemic tarsier. For those of you who don't know what a tarsia is, it's a little, cute, little nocturnal primate that kind of bounces around. It's what E.T. was based on. And I went through some old papers about the tarsia, and somebody did some research, and they gave coordinates for where they found the tarsias. Just here, Salaya, it's endemic to Salaya. Okay, so let's see what those coordinates are like. And he's put secondary forest. Perfect. So I know there's going to be some forest there. So pre-dawn, the next day, I'm there. And sure enough, I see Salaya Tarsia. Great. And I also find this, which is olive-backed sunbird. Not a particularly interesting bird. Found from India to eastern Indonesia. Garden bird. They're in my garden at home. But, as you'll see, the birds from is Salaya, the birds to the south have a black breast, the birds to the north have a yellow breast. And these birds from Salaya are different, and it's not been discussed in any recent literature. It turned out the bird had been described in uh, 1890 or something, but it just gone, got lost in, in recent literature. So that gave me renewed hope of finding this leaf warbler, because even the sunbirds there look different. And there's the whistler. And sure enough, it's nothing like a golden whistler. So again, a pretty exciting moment. I know that whatever happens, that I found this whistler, got nice photos of it. It sounds different as well. My mission is more or less complete. Um, and then it's just before I had to get a flight. I suddenly hear the unmistakable song of a philosopher's warbler. I'm very confused because, as we know, there's no philosopher's warblers here. And sure enough, I managed to locate this bird. And here we are. It turns out that the island did have a philosopher's warbler after all the undescribed Salaya leaf warbler, we'll call it. You know it's very different because the birds to the, to the north, which is this one, the Lombopatong leaf warbler, which as you'll see, really dark face markings, really dark olive green, um, not really a central crown stripe. And then the birds immediately to the south, Flores leaf warbler, gray face, yellow underparts, and there we have another philoscopist on this island that looks absolutely nothing like them. Um, and there we go. 
it does show that doing my usual route, but with a bit of planning, you can still find new species. So, as I mentioned, I was really wanting to find long lost species. And the black browed babbler episodes really ate into me over the last three years. That was the one bird that I really felt that I was going to find, and I didn't. So there was another, there's a similar bird that's been lost for an equal amount of time. Um, the Seow Scops Owl. Here we have it. Previously lumped with Sulawesi Scops Owl, which is found in all of these, all this island. And here, Sangir, which is this one, the Sangir Scops Owl. Um, Seow Scops Owl is known from a single specimen collected in 1873. So we're looking at 150 years old, and it's only known from this one specimen. Now, Seow is this tiny little island just off the North Sulawesi arm. And to the north, you have the Sangir Scops Owl. You go out at night, you see it. It's a Scops Owl. They all sound the same. They all look the same. So I was pretty confident. I thought, right, all you have to do, go to Seow, and I'll find it. There was an added incentive that several of my friends had already visited this island and unsuccessfully looked for this bird. I rather stupidly thought, great, that means that I'm going to get one over all of them because I'm going to find this bird. It's a Scops Owl. I should have taken note that all of these birders had gone and missed it for a reason, but I glossed over that at that time. So last year, um, I spent two weeks of my life on this island. And the island is home to two other endemics. There's the critically endangered, here's a tarsia, Siao Island tarsia. There's very few of them left, probably maybe fewer than 100 left. And Siao Pitta, I couldn't do a talk without having a picture of a pitta. So there's the pitta. Siao Pitta, also it's endangered. Population estimates were 50 to 249. So I thought, great, I'll get to see these as well. And I did as I did before. I looked at Google Earth and I pinpointed areas that I thought were worth visiting, areas that looked like they had forest. Um, surveys looking for tarsiers um, and for the pitta stated that there was zero natural native forest remaining on this island. And all previous birders had concentrated their efforts on the south side here. Um, this is because it's easy access. Um, it has a little bit of secondary forest. The tarsiers are there. So you know that at least you're going to see stuff. And that, it's a scops owl. It must be there. But everybody's failed. Um, so I assumed it must be because the birds are on these volcanoes. You've got an active volcano here that reaches 1,700 meters, and another one at 900 meters. So I spent two weeks of my life um, here, and I thought lockdown and COVID was bad. Two weeks on Seattle makes that pale into insignificance. This was a hard two weeks. Um, we, I will sadly disappoint you, we completely failed. Um, we didn't have any sign of this owl whatsoever. And now I've spent two weeks of my life here, I now know why. Let's keep moving. Um, I mean, we, we went into the forest at night. We would spend all night, dusk till dawn, wandering around all these areas that I pinpointed. Habitat looked okay. At night, the habitat looks fantastic. And you think that you've got ferns. It looks like some small native trees on the edge of anticipation. And then daylight, and you realize all it is is nutmeg and clove. It's 100% plantation. There's absolutely zero 
habitat that you'd expect to see an owl in. Um, these, these guys are actually in a ramp. This is a rambutan tree. And we walked out with these at night because if you see here, there's a net. And they're erected 20 meter high nets for bats, the flying foxes, uh, to eat. And these guys would always tell me that, yep, there's owls here, lots of owls. Um, and we followed every single lead, but the owls that they described never came to fruition. Um, Northern Bubok, a migratory owl, is also here. So that's probably what those sightings were. We went to tel telecom towers, climbed up to the top of them, so we could listen over the whole of the forest. I spent three hours at night just sat there listening to the forest, the silence of the forest. And again, absolutely nothing. This was near the top uh, of the tree line. Um, and I realize now why the owl was not on the higher elevation or forest, because there is no forest there. Because the, active vo the volcano is still active, so the habitat is continually regenerating um, with all the ash and lava flow. So all it is are these little ferns. There's no habitat at all. Um, and there's a guy in the bottom right. He um, posted a video um, on YouTube. You see a little scops owl on his shoulder. Um, he put that on YouTube saying it was the owl scops owl. Um, but we, we interviewed him and he probably purchased this owl. Um, it was shortly after two birders had spent a considerable amount of time on this island. John Gregor's around here somewhere. You're at fault for me wasting some time here. Um, yeah, he had heard that there was two birders looking for this bird and thought he would make, make a name for himself. So his story didn't quite add up when we were interviewing him. Um, there was various aspects of his interview where he missed out uh, important elements. He, he had photos of this owl in the foliage. And when we asked him for the account on how this bird was, he said, oh, it, it just flew into my printing shop. Um, he lives on the coast. It flew from the sea into my printing shop. I picked it up. I put some rope on its leg and tied it to the um, railing. And then three hours later, it flew off. How did it fly off if it was tethered leg to the railing? Oh, the, the rope must have fallen off. Right. Didn't go anywhere else? No, it didn't go anywhere else. What about the photo of the bird in the foliage? Oh, yeah, I forgot. I, yeah, I took it out there to take photos of it in the foliage. Lots of things didn't quite add up. So, and the bird's a juvenile. So he probably purchased it from a... Uh, a trading city and brought it in, trying to make a bit of a name for himself. But who knows? It is still a mystery, this bird. And if anybody wants to get one over me and really frustrate me, please go to Seattle, spend two months there, and report back to me what you find. Um, these are the various fun aspects of discovery, rediscovery, and failings in Indonesia and Asia as a whole. And finally, what left is there? There's still lots to discover in Asia. I'm fairly certain of it. New species get found every year still, many of which remain undescribed for, for many years. Um, there's certain areas on this map that I am very keen to visit and I will leave you with one of the frustrations of searching for new birds is that sometimes you can also find a new bird and you know it's a new bird, but it might be a juvenile or a female. So you haven't seen the male, you don't know if the male is going to be different, but this female flower pecker looks different to all the other female flower peckers where this photograph is taken, but um, we don't know how different it is, or at least until I did this talk. That's one for 
those that become members of Oriental Bird Club and get their next bird in Asia will enjoy reading about. Thank you. Thank you, James. That was fantastic, including the best pea story I've heard for quite a while. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, any questions for, for James? I'm, I'm sure there will be. No, done. Keith. Where do you want to go to next? Why do you want to know? <laughs> I was going to say, and can we get there first? Um, South East Sulawesi. I think the, the mountains there, I've spent a bit of time in them already, but not enough time. I think um, Sulawesi is really interesting because I, I mentioned earlier you've got the forearms that have all come together. And there's one or two species that are found in the other arms, but not in that one yet. So I, it's relatively unexplored. Uh, Heinrich actually spent a lot of time collecting there. Um, so I think that, was, that would be the next place I want to go to and revisit the Muratus Mountains because I think there's still work to be done there. Yeah. At what point do you think uh, the reason we're not finding it there is that it's extinct? And do you think that's the case? And this is for you personally, because I know there could be a big discussion about that, but for you personally. And do you think that's the case with Seattle Scops Owl? Yeah. But Seattle Scops Owl, it's really interesting because Siao, Sangir Islands, they have a handful of endemics and there's another endemic on Sangir, uh, Sangir Dwarf Kingfisher, that is also only known from specimens. But when you look into it, the specimens are, were uh, traded and collected in Manado, which is uh, the main city on mainland Sulawesi, not on the islands. So Siao Scops Owl specimen, for example, the collector received it from a hunter in Manado. And they said that it was from Siao. Likewise, the dwarf kingfisher, they said it was from Sangir. I think there is a real possibility that these birds are not actually from that island. So are those Siao Scops Owl if it is on Seattle, I mean, if I say it's extinct, somebody goes there and rediscovers it, great. And I'd love to be proven wrong. I really would. But for me, it's, it's gone. But how do you prove that? I think it's very difficult. You know, pink-headed duck and crested shell duck and white-eyed river martin still aren't classed as extinct yet, clearly are. Um, I think Seattle Scops Owl is gone, but then, whether or not it actually came from Seattle, I think that's a discussion to also be had. <laughs> next year. <laughs> so, next question. <laughs> Rook, Rook's blue flycatcher is a bird that is, there's four specimens. Uh, two were from a trading hub again in Malacca. Um, coastal Malaysia, two specimens from Sumatra. It's a little blue Sionis flycatcher. Again, that is a bird that, oh, when was that collected? 18 something or other. Highly distinct. There's no doubt about its validity as a species. It is one that is probably hiding in plain sight. Birders just haven't been. It's just there waiting to be found. Yeah, I've got a pretty good idea. <laughs> There's going to be an expedition for that next year. It's a bird that's, I mean, that was last seen in the, in the late 90s. So there's still a chance of that being around. Um, yeah, but it's, a lot of the time these birds that haven't been seen for a long time, it's, Birders are creatures of habit. They continually go to the same places. One thing I've, it makes me feel really old because when I first used to go, you know, birding with a backpack for weeks, months on end, 
we just have, you know, some old trip reports or we just go wherever and, and we go and explore and we'd be happy with what we see. We'd see maybe 80% of the birds we're hoping for and miss you at 20%. It's fine. You'll go back for them later on in life. But a lot of younger birders now that go to all these places, they're so reliant on, say, using eBird data, um, sound recordings. They want to know exactly where to go, where the territory of every bird is. And it's all about trying to see every tick now. If, if they don't see 100% of the species, they're disappointed. So I think far fewer, despite access to remote areas being easier now, I think far few, fewer birders actually go looking for stuff. There's so much information for where to see stuff that's already known. Birders end up wanting to see that. It's actually something that I find really disappointing. Because when you, when you were younger, in your 20s, that's when you go out exploring, trying to find stuff. And it's, it's very notable that stuff that gets found, like even in the last five, 10 years, it's nearly always, always by birders who are, old, who are you know, 40 or above. It's all birders that grew up wanting to explore and visit new areas. It's very noticeable that no new birds get found by birders in their 20s, early 30s, unless, um, unless been to new places, yeah. Yeah, it's, I have a really bad lower back, <clears throat> so I can't carry much equipment either. But there's, um, there's a really nice little Sony sound recorder. I'll find the A10 or something. That has a, an inbuilt microphone. And that is good enough just to put in your pocket and just get a sound recording if you want to get a sound recording. I mean, all, mobile phones now, they all have a, a recording device, but it's horrific quality. It does. It completely misses the higher, um, higher frequencies. Just a little Sony sound recorder, A10, I think it is. Stick that in your pocket. Use that. It's a great thing, and it's also great for talk that Pam gave earlier about how you can contribute as a citizen scientist into eBirds. You know, you don't have to carry lots of equipment. You don't have to have a great big shotgun mic or a, a parabola microphone. You can just have a little one hear something, get a recording, it'll have a little inbuilt speaker as well, and you can put that onto eBird, for example. Um, stuff like that is actually probably good for somebody to write about, you know, and put on, online for, for just recreational birders to, to use. I mean, I don't carry big sound recording equipment anymore. I just carry, you know, something like that. Time for one more question, if anyone's... Question. Right then, only falls for me to say thank you again to James. Uh, fascinating Thanks. talk, um, as as we expected. I think it's fair to say. Uh, we're nearing the end of our day. I'd like to say a quick thank you to all of our speakers, um, to OBC and to BOC for all the hard work behind the scenes, and in particular to Douglas and all his staff at the NHM who have uh, received us uh, so royally. I know. Douglas has had a lot on his plate with uh, various things going on in his life in terms of uh, professional deadlines at exactly the same time as we're trying to pull this together. So thank you very much for your hard work too, Douglas. <laughs> and so hopefully, 